Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the State of the Arc podcast. My name is Mike. My name's Kason. And today is our first episode of our near replicant slash gestalt analysis. You just saw that the images changed behind us. We got gestalt behind me and replicant behind Kason. Yep. Because those are the versions of the game that we are both looking at. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the remaster of Nier, when we upload this video, it will be on the day that the remaster comes out, which is nice. the 23rd, I believe, uh -huh. of April. And that is only the replicant version that is being remastered. Yeah, this one. Yes. However, in the past, the replicant version was only available in Japanese. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Gestalt version, which just disappeared, is was the version that we got in English. Um, in Japan, they had an Xbox 360 and a PS3 version, mm. and the Xbox 360 version was Gestalt. Yes, the PS3 yeah. version was Replicant, and then everywhere else, both of them were G Gestalt. Were G Gestalt, and um, the in Japan, I don't know how many people had an Xbox, but Not very, very few. <laughs> <laughs> Probably in the single thousands, like of the actual consoles that were sold in Japan. Yeah. Very not not popular. So, anyways, we're going to describe why this choice was made, why mm -hmm. they released two different versions, yeah. and everything um, as we go through the dev history section uh, talking about Nier. Um, but before we get started, for those of you who are new to the channel, you've never seen us before, this analysis series that we do is, you can think of it kind of like a book club for video games. The mm. whole sort of structure, the way we're doing this is that we're going to play through a certain section of the game. In this case, we played up through the junk heap and the seafront. Yeah. And then we stopped there. So we're not going to be discussing anything today that happens after that point. So, Which is going to be weird yes. because setting up the game and everything. But we're, we'll, we'll do our best. Yeah, so the point is to not spoil anything past yeah. that for players who have not played past that yet. And yes. since Near Replicant, the remaster just came out, a lot of people who have not played it before are picking it up for the first time. Yeah. So you can kind of think of this as like a play along series, right? So you play up to the same spot that we stop at and then watch the video and then you continue playing to yeah. the next spot. So for those of you who are likely going to say, no, you're, you're, you don't get it wrong. This isn't ex exactly what happened at the beginning. This happens because of this. Well, if it's not revealed until later on in the game, we're not going to talk about it until later on in the game. And so we're, we're going to tell you what the game wants you to know at this moment in time, but not necessarily what the truth is that you find out later. Right. So we'll pick up the reveals as they happen yeah. and then reflect on you know, the setups before and how they led into this, right? So that's kind of like how we do these uh, analysis yeah. series. Um, so that being said, uh, if you have any questions, uh, we're going to be playing up to the ending, the first ending, the A ending of Nier for the next episode. Yeah. So for this one, we stopped at Seafront and Junk Heap after we finished those two. Um, so we have not finished part one of the game yet, right? But yeah. uh, next time we're going to get all the way through ending A. And then we'll just talk up to ending A. And then on the next one we'll do other endings. And we'll let you know where we get up to at that point. So um, that should essentially set up how we do this and where we played up to today. Um, yep. One more thing that I want to talk about before we jump in and get started. Is that this is a monthly podcast at the moment. So we release one episode per month. Um, based on how well our Final Fantasy VIII series did uh, that we released before um, and, and based on how you feel about this one, if you would like to support the show and get it to a weekly release schedule instead of a monthly release schedule, mm -hmm. um, hit up our Patreon or uh, Subscribestar pages. The, the links are in the description. And we have a goal there where if we can hit 2000 per month, this will become a weekly show. And we're yeah. getting close. We're getting really close to hitting that. It's, it's, it's really not something that's far away. It's like there are definitely enough people watching and enjoying that if you want to chip in, uh, we can get there. So you want it to be a weekly show? We're really close. Hit up those Patreon or Subscribestar links. Uh, those are in the description. And, uh, and we'll see what we can do. So 
there's kind of a lot to get through. Um, how much dev history research were you able to do, or did you just look? More I did at a other decent things? amount. I was mostly looking at um, like Drakengard and Nier's uh, kind of connection yeah. with Drakengard and how that leads in story wise. Yeah. And kind of you know where Drakengard came from initially. Uh, with Yoko Taro and the fact that Yoko Taro did not direct Dragon Guard 2. Nope. Which is <laughs> interesting. Um, yeah. But I did look into uh, like a decent amount. Okay. So, so uh, chime in because like absolutely. the last time, like on the FF8 episode, it yes. was like 95% me just talking <laughs> about their history. <laughs> you know, like the first hour and a half. You know, I've, I've so, got the knowledge in my head and we'll, we'll see. We'll see what that So, takes chime us. in with anything you want to say during this. Feel free to interrupt me. Um, I, I personally really find dev history to be fascinating, especially to look into it before you start playing a game. Um, and that's for a couple reasons. I mean, this is primarily a story analysis podcast. We're looking, yeah. we're not going to be looking at the gameplay very thoroughly. Yeah. We might mention here and mention there. mention it, yeah. Oh, this boss was fun or this was cool. Right. I like how this mechanic works. But that's not really like what we're doing. It's not like a gameplay analysis. It's a story analysis. Yeah, for the most part. So time. we're mostly going to be looking at that. Um, but and, and because of that, I really like to look into like as much as possible the developer intentions. Like mm -hmm. when they wrote the story, like why were they writing it? Um, what were some of their inspirations? Um, who did what? Like who was responsible for which part? Right. Um, how did the development? Uh, uh, the development of the game, whether it ran into rocks or bumps along the road, how did that affect what had to be cut, or like how did that change oh, the story? A lot of stuff was cut from near, yeah. like a huge mm. amount of stuff from what I was looking at. So, anyways, I think all of that, when you look at that first, it gives you a clearer picture of like what they were setting out to do, and then you can you know look at that and get like a better feel for how close or not, they got to reaching those goals that they had, right? Mm. So that's why I like to start here. So, Nier is an action RPG, and it was developed by a company called Cavia. A lot of people think Nier is a Square Enix thing, right? right? They're the publisher. The publisher, yeah. not the developer. And that's kind of a, a key thing. Now, they did lend some development, um, like, assistance. Mm. But Cavia is like a separate company. Well, not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> not anymore. And this is the craziest thing because Near Near didn't do like it didn't. I don't know. It sold pretty well, but not like crazy well. Yeah. Um, but Near was the last game that Cavia made. Yes. Before the first they Nier. got dissolved into a separate company. Right. So so yeah, Near Automata Nier. was developed by Platinum Games. Yes. Not by Cavia. Yeah. And we'll talk about that more too. But yes, you're right. Cavia was the the last game that they made, or more or less. They were kind of working on some other things that got canceled oh, and yeah. never released. But when they kind of folded as a company, but yeah. the last game that they put out there actually was Near. And um, it's interesting because. There were two guys who sort of, I think they founded Cavia together. One of them was Takamasa Shiba, who was an Enix producer. This is before mm. the Square Enix merger. It's like 1999 area. Okay. When Ta uh, Takamasa Shiba met with uh, Takuya Iwasaki. And Iwasaki was a Namco employee who had directed mm. uh, Ace Combat 3. Ah. You know what? Yeah. That's fascinating. Right. Because of Drakengard. Because, because of what Drakengard's gameplay, gameplay is. Of Drakengard, yeah. Right? Interesting. So Iwasaki was the Ace Combat 3 director, and he was meeting with this Enix producer, Shiba, and they were talking about this idea for a game that mm. involved flying a dragon, like dr flying simulator type gameplay, but on yeah, dragons. but on a dragon. And uh, the two of them kind of got together and founded Cavia, right? So they're kind of the heads of this Cavia mm -hmm. company. But Shiba is also uh, a Square Enix producer, or was an Enix producer at the time, but when the merger happens, he's now a Square Enix employee. Mm. So that's where they get the funding, right? Square Enix produces right. and, uh but it's developed by this company, Cavia. It's a, it's a similar situation to, like, Square Enix produces a lot of things that they don't in develop internally. Like yes, yeah. 
they didn't develop um, Bravely Default. Oh, right. Or, or like um, Hitman. Yeah, Hitman or the, the like X. those are all the uh, the Eidos. Eidos, that's the it. Eidos games. In Canada, yeah. Um, Tomb Raider. Yeah. Uh, Just Cause. Well, Hitman. and then there's like Lost Sphere and stuff. Is that technically yeah, within? I, Is that well, a branch within? I don't know. Because there's Tokyo RPG Tokyo Factory. Tokyo RPG Factory, which I'm not but sure. But are they? I'm not sure yeah, whether they're like technically a like their own thing or whether they're mm. a part of Square Enix. I, I'm not sure. Okay, like yeah. if Square Enix has ownership in Tokyo RPG Factory. Yes, yes. Uh, so it's like second party. They're not quite third party. Yeah. I don't think that's what Cavia was. Cavia mm. was a completely separate thing. Okay. Then, anyways. But they were still, everything that they made was primarily, well, they did some, uh, they did some work on some other games that were not Square Enix produced, but. Okay. Uh, Square Enix produced Dragon Guard and Nier. So those are the important ones, right? Dragon Guard one and two, and three. Which even though later, three yeah. was not actually developed by Cavia either, Cavia yeah. had already folded by then. Right, because it Ca came out after Nier. Yeah. Dragon Guard three was actually developed by Access Games, which um. is the same company that makes like Deadly Premonition. Oh, interesting. <laughs> huh. So, well, this company has kind of this franchise has kind of bounced around a lot. Yes. Yes. And because it, it's not That's a Square funny. Enix developed thing, they don't have one of their own teams internally yeah, yeah. dedicated to Nier like they do for their flagships like Final Fantasy or Dragon Kingdom Quest, Hearts, yeah. Dragon Quest. Yeah. So those they develop internally, and Nier they don't have the staff to have like a Nier business division, mm -hmm. right? So, anyway, so it's more or less outsourced to it's outsourced some to company. another company. But they own the distribution rights, though, so no one yes. else can make it unless they say. Right. Here you go. Exactly. So, uh, anyways, Shiba and Iwasaki, mm. when they got together and they kind of came up with this idea for Dragon Guard, they had never really like formally done any creative writing on their own part. Okay. Right. Um, and so that's why they brought in two uh, figures. Uh, Yoko Taro was one of them. Yoko Taro. And then and is it? Um Yosuke Saito, is that it? Uh, Sawa Sawako Natori. Oh, okay. Sawako Natori. The, the producer. Okay, nice. So, so Iwasaki and Shiba were like, they sort of conceived the concept, and Yoko Taro helped with that. But then, like, mm. Taro and Natori, like, wrote the game, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So that's that's kind of like the four people who were at the at the top who sort of came up with the Dragon Guard concept. Um, and so while Taro is the one who's like the well-known figurehead in the I, industry is like... I wonder, <laughs> I, I have some ideas as to why that is. Well, he's, to put it lightly, an eccentric personality. Yes, exactly. Right? <laughs> It's it's a marketing thing. He walks <laughs> on stage with that with that mask yeah, helmet he thing that he's wearing, and the, he gets the attention immediately, no matter what. Yeah, it's a genius on his part or whoever came up with that to kind of market him as one of this great um, game developer type people. I don't, I'm not even sure how, at least mm -hmm. on his own part, on Taro's own part, how uh, intentional that sort of like marketing of him being the yeah. intentional personality is because. The reason he wears a mask is because he hates photographing himself. Yes, there's a lot of similarities between him and um, Tetsuya Nomura as well, by yeah. the way. And that's one of them. They don't li love their appearance. They don't want to be photographed. Yeah. They don't want people to see them. And I don't know what Yoko Taro looks like. <laughs> you know? So it worked. Good, good on him, yeah. I suppose. But then he also, he also really hates doing interviews. So like he, like his reasoning for this is... He feels like game developers shouldn't be, um, they're not like, they're not entertainers in you the know, way of though, like getting in front of a crowd. But when he and, wears that mask, I know you, he's clearly getting attention and, and looking for it, you know? I don't know. Possibly. I, I don't, you, <laughs> you, you, you go anywhere dressed like that and you're attracting the eyeballs more than you otherwise would. The point is he's <laughs> a, he's out there. He's an yeah. out there guy. He is. Very creative and, it seems. And it, it comes across in the style, and we'll talk about style a little bit later, it's something we usually dissect on these podcasts, but we'll talk about his style a bit later. But I have a quote here from him. 
he says, if I make something half-hearted or normal, I don't think it'll beat the likes of Final Fantasy or Dragon Quest. I believe that is what led to the wild pitch result of what we have. So Drakengard was kind of made into this sort of bizarre, disturbing, dark, um, yeah. unconventional story. In mm. part because they didn't feel like they could really compete with the likes of Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest. So to sure. make this memorable, yeah. they went with this like super like dark sort of demented, sort of unconventional story. I mean, story. it worked. It, it worked. And it did. Very well. So anyways, that's where kind of like the style of Yoko Taro as we know it yeah. was sort of born from. He's an eccentric dude. He didn't want to make something that, that tried to compete in the realm or in the sphere of yeah. Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest. He wanted it to stand out. And so Drakengard became... It's a game that harbors some controversy. It has some controversial mm. adult subject material in it. Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, thing there's like incest and, and just <laughs> like the 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 the, um, the character, the main character himself Kain. is like a sociopathic, insane, hardcore, just like yes, willing to do anything to like get and his and hands the right. the Angelus the dragon, the dragon that is with him the whole mm -hmm. time. Uh, often brings that up when yeah. they're fighting and stuff. Uh, Angelus is like, "I'm a freaking dragon, and you are more ruthless than anyone I've ever known in my <laughs> yeah. life." Like, this yeah. is crazy. Like, humans are insane. If the, yeah. if you are a good representation of humans, and so yeah. the reason why he did that, and this is part of why I this is one thing I like about Yoko Taro's like thought process mm -hmm. into like how he thinks about video games. He he sort of saw that like video games more or less become about killing hundreds yes. and thousands of people. As many as you can, yes. <laughs> but like these characters are sort of portrayed to us as these noble, um, yep. you know, uh, what do you call it, uh, honorable heroes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And his thought Always. was like, anyone who has the capability to kill at that level has got to be insane themselves. Yes. Right? Yes. And so that's Just why he made, he made Kaim an insane character yeah. for that reason. So... I mean, that makes sense. And it's often yeah. remarked on. And But that game, the Dragon Guard's crazy because as you're going throughout the game, you it's, it's like failure after failure. Everything keeps yeah. failing. Everything keeps going wrong. Even when you beat a boss, it, you didn't get what you wanted. Like, basically, Kaim can never be satisfied. He never has what he wants. Yeah. Like, it, there's always, and for other story reasons, everything just goes completely wrong in the game. But the first ending of the game is actually, like, pretty decent. Like, it's yeah. a normal ending. Yeah. It's the other four that get really screwed up. Like, really <laughs> jacked up. Yeah. Like, crazy, crazy jacked up stuff. But the first ending is like, oh, that was actually pretty good. <laughs> it's it's and, fascinating. And this is where... We're going to kind of transition to how this is related to Nier, but... Well, Nier is very similar in that, in that regard of, of having no sympathy for the enemies you're fighting. Yes. And, you know, maybe what that means down the line. But, um, so, Drakengard stood out. Like, the reason it became kind of a cult, had it garnered a cult following, yeah. was because of this taro styled yeah. Storytelling, right? Yeah, people got game, people were really into it. The game itself mm. is really not that good. <laughs> no, it, it's kind of like a Dynasty Warriors Musou yes. type thing mixed with some Ace Combat. Like, and some, so the reason why though, it's, it's that, why it has that Dynasty Warriors like yeah. part to the game is they were kind of mid development, and Sheba, the Square Enix producer, uh -huh. came in and was like, you know, Dynasty Warriors two just had a lot of success. Yeah. We should add a Dynasty Warriors type ground Ooh. gameplay to Dragon Guard. Anytime uh, <laughs> there's a mid development change yeah. in the game like that, it's it's obvious. Yes. Yeah. And so I think and that that's the worst A lot of the though. rough edges of Dragon Guard's yeah. gameplay were due to this like time trying to kind of in the middle of the game's development, yeah. throw in this Drakengard ground gameplay. It does work towards that theme we were talking about earlier, though, because yeah. with Dynasty Warriors, Just more than any game, everybody. you one sword swing, and it's like <laughs> 10, you, it's like a whole unit, or a whole squadron, or whatever. You just, you've wiped out so many people with each, each swing of the sword. Right. So, anyways, what Square Enix failed to understand with this is that when they decided to go towards making a sequel, mm. 
they didn't realize that Drakengard had the fandom that it had, not because of how the game played, but because of the dark storyline. Right. And the and, Which, and the intense the <laughs> yeah. intensity of that, right? Because Drakengard two takes place after that first ending. What I mentioned yeah. is actually like a pretty peaceful, normal Right. Good after ending. the A ending. Yeah, of the A ending. And well, anyways, you 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 you're moving on after you know a decent ending. The game isn't going to be as dark, right? Yeah, and what's interesting too is that originally Tara was told that there was not going to be any sequel to Dragon Guard, yeah. and that was the whole reason he decided to do multiple endings. The whole oh, reason he decided really? to make all these different endings because he had all these ideas. Was like, oh, you know, what if we went this way or that way or whatever? And yeah. he was like, well, let's just make a bunch of side endings. Mm, and but then. Square decided, oh, you know, this sold well enough, especially well enough. in Japan, yeah. that we could do a sequel. But we don't want the controversy that comes with sort of this like messed up dark story that you yeah, did. Yeah. And Taro <laughs> sort of swore off of directing any sequels because of how yeah. difficult the development of Dragon Guard 1 was. Okay, that makes sense. Was. So he's like, I'm sense. not touching Dragon Guard ever again. Okay. At, at, at the beginning, at at, the right after it was over, he's like, I'm, I'm not directing this. Yeah. I'll be involved. I'll, I'll edit your videos. But, well, <laughs> he actually made a pitch for Dragon Guard 2, and this speaks to his personality, oh, he? where he wanted it to be a space simulation where you fight on Whoa. dragons in space. <laughs> oh, that's crazy. And they were like, no, that's not going to be Dragon Guard 2. But so they someone rejected should do that. <laughs> they rejected his premise. Oh, right? man. But I'd he, heard he also had an idea for an ending that was supposed to be within ending E. Oh. Which was instead of the uh, the the goddess, I can't remember what, it's, what the name is. Uh, instead of the big figurine that you end up fighting, uh, which is de is important to near. So I'm I'm not <laughs> giving away this part. Isn't um, such a big deal. I don't think um, that there was supposed to be like a pop idol, like some Japanese pop oh, idol weird. comes from the clouds <laughs> and descends upon Tokyo, and that's why that fight. The fight yeah. at, the, at the E ending of Drakengard is like a rhythmic based thing where there's like, it's like a dance dance revolution that makes tons type of sense to me. kind of thing. And so it's like they took that same gameplay but they decided to make it into one of the, the Watcher gar, um, the big gods, giant. the goddess yeah. thing, yeah. But it was he wanted it to be a music idol because he's like, if we're just going to joke around here, like let's go full exactly. on. Exactly. It makes yeah. a lot of sense because ending E similarly to say like the UFO endings in Silent Hill or the uh, dog yeah. ending in Silent Hill right. was meant to be a joke ending. Yeah. So Silent Hill kind of has this recurring thing where it's like if you do, if you take pictures of all the UFOs, then uh, you'll nice. get this ending that's a UFO joke ending. Okay, and nice. the, the E ending of Drakengard was intended to be that to type be of like joke that. ending. Which that's is funny. why it's really bizarre. It feels weird too. But it too. sounds like it was supposed to, be, supposed to be even weirder than that. Yes, it was going to be even weirder. <laughs> As if they hadn't already gone full weird, like they could have gone even further. Yeah. Yeah. So anyways, it was shot it's down important apparently. to note that this is the reason why Dragon Guard has as many endings as it had, and that the E ending was meant to be a joke ending. This yes. is going to spur us into uh, near here in a second, but I want to yeah. talk a little bit about Dragon Guard 2, okay. just for a second. Oh, that's fine. Because um, they, it was directed by a different person, mm -hmm. right? So they brought in somebody else, and according to Sheba, um, which I have a quote for here. Or, or sorry, here's the quote from Taro. He says, when I created the first Dragon Guard, I was told that there'd be no sequel. So I created multiple endings without thinking ahead. You know, all the disasters that happened after that. So the disasters he's talking about are his creative differences with mm -hmm. Square, right. which, which is why he didn't want to direct any more Dragon Guard games. They would not let mm -hmm. him just have his creative control over Dragon Guard. Which apparently they did soften up on that for Nier. Yes. They were way less involved that was for the, Nier. That was kind of the but, stipulation. Yeah. Is he is very much a I must retain my creative control yeah, type of guy, right? But the game has to sell. <laughs> you, <laughs> and so you gotta be pleased both. So he yeah. clashed a lot with mm -hmm. the advisory board of Dragon Guard. Can you imagine him walking into the creative meetings and stuff with that helmet? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. That wasn't until later. Um, so anyways, it got handed off to Akira Yasui to direct Dragon Guard 2. And he went almost the total opposite direction tone-wise. Um, he was like, okay, we're going to dumb down or, or back off a little bit on some of this like super dark controversial mm. material. And we're going to open the color palette 
so while they improved on the game mechanics somewhat, mm. it's still not like a masterpiece of right. video game gameplay wise, but it's improved over the first game. Mm. People did not love Drakengard 2 mm. because it sort of abandoned everything about the identity of the first game right. that people really liked about it. And because of that, Drakengard 2 is not considered canon. <laughs> um, in terms of near and and this all this stuff, right? And so, anyways, uh, this is where Sheba says in an interview. For the second one, they said, "Please make it more conservative." So we followed that suggestion, and the game wasn't well received. Because mm. of that, we figured out what our audience wants. That's how we came about, uh, or that's how we came about what the tone of Drakengard Three would be. Now, what's he referring to when he says Drakengard Three? Because good there, there is a quote from him saying that he believe he refers to Nier as Drakengard Three. Well, and Taro for does himself. As well. Yeah. So uh, Drakengard Three or Nier, what Mont. became Nier, mm -hmm. which is the game we're going to be talking about in some analysis, was originally intended to be Drakengard Three. Right. That was what it was. Uh, it, it, they set out to do at the beginning of it. So he could. Very well, be talking about near here, okay. um, or depends Dragon on when the 3, quote was because it it really applies to both of them. Yeah, Dragon Guard Three is a prequel to Dragon Guard because yeah. um, they went back to that really dark, kind of disturbing atmosphere for Dragon Guard Three as well. So near and Dragon Guard Three are much closer to that Taro style, yeah, unconventional uh, storytelling that Dragon Guard One started and that Dragon Guard Two abandoned. So, <clears throat> leave it to Taro to take the joke ending of Drakengard and make that the path into the That's sequel. The one. <laughs> but you know what? It makes sense in a weird way. It makes sense for him to be like, like, what's the most screwed up like possible turn of events? Let's yeah. make something out of that because right. I, I believe Nier Automata does something similar as well. It's mm. like, no, if, if there's a game with multiple endings, he he will. Every time, I believe, based on just these few instances, he will take the most screwed up ending each time because it probably gives him more creative ability to kind of do whatever he wants yeah. and to go as, as deep into the screwed upness as he wants to go. Exactly. Yeah. So, we, so in order to talk about how near story-wise is sort of connected with yeah. Drakengard, uh, we have to talk about the Drakengard E ending. So this yes. is a spoiler warning for the E ending of Drakengard, if you really don't want to hear yeah. that. We have time codes, uh, and the, the, the timeline, if you're watching this on PC, I guess, will be segmented mm -hmm. so that you can kind of skip ahead to other parts. So if you don't want to hear this, that's totally understandable, but this is how, this is where the connection to Nier and Drakengard comes into place. Yeah. So in the E ending, the protagonists of Drakengard, which are Kaim, the human, and then Angelus, Angelus yeah. the dragon, they're sort of transported, like interdimensionally, between the world of Drakengard, yes. which is not Earth. But, but you know what's <laughs> weird, though? Because it is still alternate dimension Earth. Yes. Because a lot of these things did take place on Earth, in Europe in general. Drakengard is kind of a screwed it's, up history of Earth. Right. But it's a, inspired, different, a different Earth. It's I guess. inspired by, like, um, Celtic and like a lot of northern yes. yeah. uh, European yep. sort of like history. Right? But but Medieval it really history. does take place on Earth, Drakengard. All right, quick addendum. So I just wanted to fact check Kaysen on this a little bit uh, because I wasn't sure whether Drakengard really took place in an alternate dimension Earth. And this is what it says about Midgard's world, uh, or Drakengard's world, which is called Midgard. Midgard is the known world in which the Drakengard series takes place. It appears identical in shape to real world Europe, albeit flipped upside down. So, yeah, you can kind of see the map here. So, I guess in a technical sense, it kind of is a real world Europe in some alternate dimension. So, there you go. Okay. D but not the right dimension, I guess. <laughs> so it, there's Earth. a dimensional <laughs> travel that happens where Kaim yeah. and Angles come to our Earth, Tokyo. Mm -hmm. um, in, well, I think they come into Tokyo. But <laughs> yeah, it's above Tokyo in yeah. 2003. Uh, and so there's a battle that happens there. And essentially, 
Kaim and his dragon and the giant and all the babies yes. that fly out of the sky. <laughs> all of these <laughs> magical elements yeah. coming from this other dimension. Yeah. They are sort of killed or destroyed or they dissolve. Yeah. And so because they don't know what's happening at first. Yes. But they kill it, it's just there. But yeah, it turns into essentially like a, a pillar of salt is the way yes. they word it. And yeah, it slowly starts to disintegrate. And there's this magical property to their bodies that is not part of our world, our Yes, dimension, right? it comes from somewhere else. And these were, I believe these were something along the lines of what in Drakengard, what they called the Watchers. These were like the servants of the gods. Like right. I think in Japanese they call them angels, but yeah. it was translated to Watchers in English. And these are like God sent destruction vessels, basically. <laughs> and somehow one ended up in the wrong dimension. Planet. And they call it the great, I don't know if this is like the, the head god or not, the one that's this big woman that we fight. Um, but is like the leader of the Watchers, basically. Sure. Sent by the gods to destroy that other world because the seals were broken, but all of a sudden ended up in our world. And like, what would happen if that happened, right? That's yeah. Yoko Taro's thinking. Exactly. Yeah. So their bodies disintegrate in this sort of magical element when it dissolves into the air and falls down. It sort of creates yeah. this disease that uh, people start contracting called mm -hmm. white chlorination syndrome. Yes. And yeah. the idea behind it is that when a person comes in contact with that, they have to enter a pact with this god from another dimension. Now, here's where <laughs> we might want to be careful about how much of the setting we reveal. Sure. Because some of this exposition is technically not revealed. It is revealed in, late in near. Okay. In the other endings and later on in the game. Right. So. That's that's fine. I don't know exactly how far we go into the setup, though, because you don't learn about this stuff until the end of the game. <laughs> okay. Well, not everything the, you said, but from there on, the, basically. The, to very briefly summarize, yeah. people get sick, and you, you either turn into a pillar of salt if you deny yes. this pact, yes. or you join the legion a of, legion of, of like soulless zombies who yes. serve this god. Yes. So that was what happened in Earth a long time ago. Long and there time was ago. A, many experiments that we'll learn about through yes. the course of Nier. You know what? You're right. Because a lot of what we, how we learn about this stuff is through the loading screens that just yeah. kind of tell you here, this experiment happened. Yeah. Here's like some diary entries and stuff. Yeah. So, so maybe it is revealed. We'll learn less. a lot more yeah. through the course of Nier's story what happened after this and like yeah. how humanity tried to deal with it. Yeah. But for now, it was very we know intense, that yeah. like it, it essentially threatened the entire human race. Yeah. And this, it spread outside of Japan and it got everywhere. And this is where we begin Nier's prologue. Yeah. Um, in Tokyo in 2049. 2053, I think you meant to say. No, I'm just kidding. In Near Replicant, there's a difference. In Near, I don't know why they did this. I get why they maybe changed the characters, but in the game, um, they decided to have Near Gestalt take place in 2049. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know but that. But Near Replicant takes place in 2053. Weird. A four year difference. I don't know why they made that decision, but that is that, that is, is the difference within the game. Well, let's talk about the two versions real quick. <laughs> there's a lot to Since talk that kind of comes into it. Yeah. Here's the thing. So you, if you're just, this is your first time, like maybe you played Automata or something, but you hadn't played the original. Right. Because it was on PS3, and maybe you don't have PS3 anymore. So this remaster of Nier is going to be your first exposure to the original. To Nier. Nier, yeah. Let's say that that's the case for you. You might be like, well, wait a minute. Uh, what's the difference between these two <laughs> versions? Am I going to miss something? Yeah. You shouldn't worry about it too much. Mm -hmm. There are... Almost entirely exactly the same. Yeah, day. almost completely. But the translations I found quite fascinating. And there are a few things, especially early on, that are that are quite different. There are a couple of things like you're referencing that we'll point out along the way. Yeah. Um, that could change contextually depending on if you are the older father near character yeah. or whether you are the brother younger near character. Yeah. A, a little thing, little things here and there. But for the most part, like it's not like there's different endings or like the story is like wildly different on this path than this one. Mm -hmm. They are basically exactly the same. Yeah. The only reason why they made separate versions of the game at all 
is because this is interesting. The, <laughs> the American branch of Square Enix was concerned that the younger Nier character wouldn't be as marketable as In an older, gruffer. West. And, and you yeah. look at games coming out around the same time, uh, this is kind of the trend, right? right. You, you have, um, uh, what else came out that year? Like God of War? Is this like uh, 2010? 2010, so you had like God of War 3. Yeah. And you had, uh, what's the freaking cowboy game on? Uh, oh, Red Dead. Red Dead Redemption. Yeah, yeah. You know, you had that's these right, older, that's right. kind of like gruffer, tougher, right. super hyper-masculine you know characters. It's funny though, because Square Enix had the opposite problem back 10 years before. Yeah. When with Vagrant Story, how they were like, yep. oh, you made him too old and too gruff. It didn't sell well, at least yep. not overseas. Or with Final Fantasy XII. You want to make a younger hey, character. You, let's have Vaughn be the lead character instead of Bosch, where it's like... I think part what? of that is for the Japanese market. Yeah. So they, they're they like... Oh, okay. In the but, Japanese market, they do want the younger guy, which is why that one is the Japanese yes. version. <laughs> Anyways. Yeah, that's one, the other one's the older one. So it depends on where you're more concerned. And this is why right. they split it. It's, it's why... Like we said earlier, the PS3 version, ways. the replicant PS3 version in Japan was was that character. Yeah. Whereas the Xbox 360 version, which they sold, I don't know, maybe 100 copies of in Japan. In Japan. Had that guy. <laughs> <laughs> but both versions, PS3 and Xbox, in all the regions outside of Japan, had the older father. Yeah, yeah. They call him Papa Nier. Papa and Nier. And Brother Nier. And Brother Nier, yeah. Right? So that was the reason why that choice was made. But... Taro's intended version of the character is that one. Was this one, which is why Near Replicant, this remake, is, or yes. the version one point whatever. 1.2 billion numbers. I didn't yeah. memorize the numbers, but it's the younger version. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why they're bringing that one out. But don't worry, you're not missing, like, any huge right. story thing by not playing this version. That's true, that's true. However, 100%. we did decide for this analysis that we would look at them both to yeah. see where the differences are. Right. So I played the Gestalt version because mm -hmm. that's the PS3 version of the game I have. Yeah. And then Kaysen looked at the Replicant version. You, using a fan translation though, which is Replican, the Replican fan translation, which, um, I don't know, it, 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 um, it's it been updated and changed over the years since it first came out. Um, but it's a fan translation. I guess I just wanted to make that clear that the actual translation of the game will not be um, the, same. the same translation as what I've experienced. Good point. Yeah. Good point. Okay, so um, I want to talk a little bit about Yoko Taro himself. Well, we've already talked about um, his hatred of being interviewed and photographed, right? Mm. Uh, but he tends to like to explore, like we said, these darker and more controversial aspects of human nature. Yeah. Um, it's also interesting that he writes his stories backwards. He kind of he I did writes not know it, that. he writes his endings first, and oh, then he works back to the beginning. Interesting. Oh. So he kind of knows where. Uh, this is a style that huh. I think, as a writer myself, like if I could write this way, I would try to. Yeah. Because I think it's really important to know where you're going first. Sure. And then you create all the proper setups mm. that actually build the context to give that climax or that ending its full. Like okay, nice. emotional impact or potential. Well, if you have like the theme in mind, yes. then that's smart. That's then really when you're writing all these scenes, you know yeah. what needs to be there and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. It makes it easier. It makes it cool. so you have to do less editing later, basically. Because nice. it's like, okay, we end it, we end up here, and here's everything we need to know for this to be maximized. Mm. I need to plant all that information in scene A, B, C, D, E, leading yes. up to it. Nice. It's rather than like, oh, I'm building up all this stuff, and then we go here, and it's like, oh, but now what should happen, look at yeah. all this stuff that I set up that isn't actually important. Now I have yeah. to go back and cut. So mm -hmm. I would love to write this way if I could. It's not Depends easy to do. on what kind of story you're writing, yeah. <laughs> it's really not easy to do, but this is how he writes. Well, and especially he since backwards. he has multiple endings. I mean, that's, that's yeah. kind of crazy. So um, we talked about how he clashed with the Dragon Guard Advisory Board, um, but... And, and I talked about how for Drakengard, he wanted a character that is that sociopathic, just insane mm -hmm. person um, to sort of explore why are people driven to kill. That's kind of like yeah. what Drakengard was exploring with sure. that character. Mm -hmm. Like, what is it that like 
psychologically or whatever like gets into a person that makes them willing to kill like this. Mm -hmm. But he actually wanted with Nier to have a lighter, more positive message. Mm. And that's funny for a lot of people who aren't familiar with how messed yeah. up Drakengard is yeah. and maybe just play Nier and go, this is, there's some intense stuff in here. But this was his attempt to do like to be, yeah. a brighter or a, or, or a more like positive that's sort a, of story. That's one of my notes that I took. The beginning of Nier is, is it feels very serene with the music too. Yeah. And everything feels, and you can tell there's some really screwed up stuff just below the surface mm. that every now and then it rears up briefly, but then it goes away and you're in this serene kind of environment. Um, that's, that's a very, very good contrast to Drakengard. Yeah, for sure. And um, and so we're, we're gonna dive into, and this is something I like to do too. I like to have in mind before I start playing the game, what is the thematic core of this thing? Mm -hmm. So that I can sort of like take each scene and see, like, okay, this is how they're building into the, the central message that they're gonna try to deliver with the game. So we're gonna talk about that in a second. But like I said, in, in Drakengard, he was kind of exploring why or how, or how does a person get to this point where they're willing right. to kill like this, right? Yeah. And so with Nier, he wanted to explore more of the, more of like a, a contrast of positions, like mm. um, a difference of perspective is, is kind of like what Nier is really looking at. So, and, and this came a, a lot from his observation of what happened with the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Yeah, I had read about that, that that was, so, and who, who, who was determined to be the enemy and how it yeah, all just kind of. and how, yeah. right? Like the way that like yeah. the United States justified what they did in that, in, in that war on terror as they called it. Which and from his, still going on, his position, way. exactly, <laughs> right? From his position as a Japanese person, mm. he's on, he's neither American nor uh, right. you know, uh, in the Middle East. Right. The way that he sort of observed this conflict mm -hmm. was pretty different yeah. from someone like us who right. were maybe junior high 14, school yeah. uh, in America at the time seeing yeah. the news being delivered to us by the media of our own country mm -hmm. versus how uh, people in Islamic states would have been receiving their information on this yes. in their countries from their media. Yeah. He's seeing kind of Both. two yeah. sides of this. Yeah. And this is where a lot of his um, ideas came, for Nier came from, hmm. was the observation of this conflict and how people justify what they do hmm. in, in acts of war. So we'll get back into that a little bit more in a second. But it's funny that Nier started off, like we said, as a Drakengard sequel. Mm -hmm. But, and it was a much smaller scale project at the beginning of development, but it sort of just ballooned and grew into something greater yeah. and really pretty different from what Drakengard was yeah, gameplay wise. You would not know and, that they were connected at all. Yeah. But for a few little hints that they drop in. And so Square decided to rebrand it yeah. rather than Drakengard 3 into right. what became known as Nier. It, the project was called Nier internally mm. uh, throughout. And so that just, it just became near. It became its own thing. Mm -hmm. You can think of near to Drakengard in a similar way that you can think of Persona to Shin Megami Tensei. Yeah, where it's like same like concept, same world in in a way, same world. Yeah, but really not like super. Connected. They're they're they have connections. Yeah. But the two brands have a very different identity, mm. and the the fandoms of each <laughs> are pretty different too like yeah, the target that audience that is true. persona definitely has a wider appeal i would say mm, yeah and uh, certain aspects to it especially in japan that give it that wider appeal and dragon guards or it's not drag guard uh shin megami, megami tensei, tensei is a much more hardcore mm -hmm. gaming audience right and so it has a niche -er, i guess yeah. as you could probably tell appeal. just by the name yeah. Because Shin Megami Tensei didn't bother to translate itself, the name, 
yeah. into any into English or any other Western language. You know, like where they usually use the katakana to write out some English word, like Final Fantasy, for example, yeah. is Fainoru Fantaji. They don't <laughs> say the actual Japanese words there. And so with Persona, well, that's an English word, right? Mm -hmm. And then Shin Megami Tensei. Yeah. That will never be popular in America. <laughs> I mean, you know, some people really like it, but I'm just saying it's never going to have the wide appeal because it just doesn't have the same sound. So you can tell what they're going for just based on the titles. Right. So uh, in, the last, uh, in the last analyses that we did on Final Fantasy VIII, I talked about how um, I, I kind of like, and, and uh, I did a, a video project with Patrick Holloman, and this was something that, that he said that I kind of took. I failed mm -hmm. to mention that in the last one. No. But it, it's, it's, it's an exercise I really like for determining, uh, to specify what is our theme, right? Mm -hmm. So he likes to rephrase. Ah, the theme in the form of a question because right. a lot of people say the theme of this game is life yeah, or it's yeah, yeah. love and it's like that is so vague mm -hmm. right that like you can't really specify what type of love that is and we we talked about uh uh nojima saying the similar thing right yeah. nojima final fantasy 8 writer Kazushi. was like that's too vague like what type of love are we talking about mm -hmm, yeah anyways so when we rephrase some of these things we're talking about this difference of perspective in the form of a question. I came up with two that I thought could work. And, and we'll see what people think if they want to add a, a question of their own to maybe specify it in a different way. In the mm -hmm. comments, we'll, we'll take a look at that too. But these are the two I came up with. When people are convinced they're in the right, how far will they go to see, uh, to see the ends of their cause fulfilled? Or, when convinced we're right, what will we do to those who oppose our ideology? That's a good one. It's a little and simpler both of them than that are good, last one. But that last one's a little more concise. But yeah. I feel like those help us sort of specify, okay, this is what yeah. Nier's, this is the question Nier is looking to answer, right? When we're convinced that we're right, what are we going to do to those who oppose our ideology? Now, this has become something in recent years that has been heavier and heavier, almost become a burden on my mind. Mm. And it's hard to talk about for me because I know people who, when, when I was young, were great friends. Mm. And I was part of the, this group, right? And, and I've seen people who were once this close become just a step below mortal enemies. Like, really? to the point to where yeah. if there were a civil war in this country, I would know exactly which sides these people would fight on. Yeah. And that has been such a disturbing thing for me to witness. And it's not even just with like those people. It's like people that I knew when I was in Vegas, uh, my own family members. Mm -hmm. Like I'm seeing a division politically and ideologically within our country that for me as a 33 year old seems to be mm -hmm. at this really, really intense level, of course, when I was a teenager or when I was a kid, of course I wouldn't have understood the right. political context to the same level as, say, yeah. my parents or someone else. I'm mm -hmm. sure that there's always been big conflict ideologically in all cultures and in all right. countries. But it seems to me, based on my experience, that it's way, way worse right now than I remember it ever being by far. Right. And so this question, this theme, really speaks to me at this time in my life and I think is really relevant to a lot of things that we're seeing around the world um, and a lot of the conflicts that we're seeing, uh, especially recently uh, in our country in the United States. I think I've, with all of the Western Europe as well yeah. and other, yeah. So it's, it's not just here, it would be, it's the division's happening all. It's really, all really around. intense. Yeah, but less so in like Asia and some yeah. Eastern Europe, those places. And so, I don't want to necessarily turn this podcast into, okay, let's find all the real world parallels and like make <laughs> judgments on like, yeah. <laughs> but it's because it's less so about that for me. Um, and this is something that like I've been thinking about a lot, like in determining how well Nier does, in concluding on how well it does to sort of analyze and examine and answer this question, mm. because it's <clears throat> a very, very difficult topic and there's a lot of nuance. 
um, and there's no sort of like blanket answer to any of it. And um, I, I, would, I would compare a little bit, I don't know if you've played Undertale. Undertale uh, has different endings depending mm, on yeah. whether or not you did a pacifist route and didn't right, kill anything, or, bad. or whether you slaughtered every single yeah. enemy you came across. Right, and so the criticisms of Undertale, which I think are fair, I mm. still really love the game, right. are that, the, that it's a little bit heavy-handed in its moralizing of the pacifist route. Right, right, where it's like this is this is always the right always thing to the do. right answer yeah. or the, always the right thing to do. Yeah, and I know uh, clearly that's not true. Not always true. Um, <laughs> or yeah, it's not always true. Uh, even Final Fantasy VIII touched on this a little bit with the Fisherman's Horizon. Oh uh, like yeah, guy, and right? how they were like the ends are the means. Yeah, right. that whole that whole discussion. So there's yeah. there's a lot to unpack with it, and I don't want to like, I don't want to do too much of a preamble to it. We're going to talk about it while we're going through the game. But I just want to set it up as best I can because I'm not sure how I feel about the way Nier answers this question yet. Okay. Because of the fact that it isn't always the right answer, right? Mm. There are some people who have intent to do terrible evil things and those people have to be fought. Like there's no amount of discussion or understanding you can come to with certain people yeah. who intend to yeah. do harm. And so there are times when you have to fight them. You have to stand up, I and so. that's really the only right answer. Yeah. However, what I think is becoming muddy in our current political discourse between just normal people in our country is that we are starting to view each other, just normal everyday citizens, just our neighbors and people around mm. us, who pretty much, for the most part, have good intent we're starting to view them as if they are our mor mortal enemies. Yes. And this is I've been where that a lot. this is where I think yeah. near this is what near is speaking to. Hmm. This is where I think near's message can be applied more than say clearly there are certain dictatorial authoritarian figures in the world who have the clear mal intent to do terrible yes. terrible harm. And somehow they make it to the top quite and they, often. And they're in a position like yeah. that where they have that much power. They have to be stopped and resisted. Yeah. They have to be fought because there's no other way. Mm -hmm. Like if a person's intent really is that, you're not going to talk them out of it. Right. But your neighbors and family and friends and mm -hmm. uh, community members, that's very unlikely to be the case. Right. So it's about learning to decipher between you know, does this person really have the intent mm. to harm me? Or are they doing just what they think is right? And do I think that they, maybe they're just misguided? And can we have a conversation and come to some form of compromise right. or something like that? I hope that makes sense. It does. It makes perfect but sense. But I think that those are kind of two lenses or two things that you need to understand mm -hmm. in order to like fairly judge how near answers this question about a difference of perspective okay. anything that you no i think add that's that? that's well put and specifically with reference to the theme of this game yeah th this is something we will continue to revisit yeah. in the future okay so that should lead us right into okay one last thing i guess only one last thing about dev history um so kind of like how Drakengard was affected by the popularity of Dynasty Warriors, mm -hmm. right? Sheba said, Dynasty Warriors are really popular. We need Dynasty Warriors combat yeah, in our game. Make it happen. Uh, Square Enix had Kingdom Hearts as yes. a really big, successful action RPG yes, yeah. at the time. And One of the other parallels that I found between <laughs> Tetsuya Nomura and, and Yoko Taro, despite the fact that their stories are very different, yeah. they, they, they explore similar themes. Yeah. So there are some... Because of the popularity of Kingdom Hearts, especially mm -hmm. internally at Square Enix as the producer of this game, uh, they there are some Kingdom Hearts influences. You can tell that mm -hmm. they went to them and said, we want a Kingdom Hearts for adults. But dark, yeah. What's well, a dark <laughs> Kingdom Hearts? Yes. We want a dark adult version of Kingdom Hearts yes. and we want Nier to be kind of like that. I do get the feeling in the game. And yeah. while Yoko Taro has admitted, and while it's true, that he didn't have a lot of outside influence. He was basically mm -hmm. allowed to kind of pursue his own creative path for this, 
which was his kind of stipulation to direct it, right? Mm -hmm. You can still see some of those Kingdom Hearts influences in Nier, and, yeah. and in particular with the Shades. You know, uh -huh. the Shade enemies I, being I was like thinking Heartless. A name, a very good name for, yeah, Heartless, or I was thinking Unversed, yeah. would have been a pretty yeah. good, except, anyways, there's funny reasons for that, but um, the Shade kind of act like Unversed, to yes. me, which is like Kingdom Hearts 2, more or less. Right, and without spoiling anything, the terms replicant and gestalt are important to the story. Yeah. It's not just a, a, a funky Japanese naming convention where like, they just have a yeah. billion words on it, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's not like that. Yeah. Replicant and gestalt are important terms big in the story. Big references for the story. And yeah. basically the idea of how replicants and gestalts are uh, connected to each other yes. has some Kingdom Heartsy. <laughs> It's very similarities. Similar. It's very similar. Yeah. So yes. another interesting point about like just how Nier sort of found its identity. Right? Yeah. But this leads us into one really important thing that I actually feel like is going to be important to like fully comprehending Nier's mm -hmm. like attempt to answer that question we talked about. But I think you might even be better to look at this than me because it has to do with how language is oh, used yeah. in the game. Um, so there's a couple of things that, like, again, I'm, I'm not sure how I feel about this yet. I haven't, like, yeah. reached conclusions on it. We're still kind of in the middle of playing. Sure, sure. But, so, like, when you leave the start screen alone, um, mm. and uh, it'll have all these letters, these kind of, like, strange symbols and things, mm. and they kind of, like, melt away, and then it'll have, like, uh, the English text underneath it that sort of, like, I guess it's translating more or less what that text was on the screen. Yeah. Um, so that's like the first thing we see where there's this other language, right? The idea is that, and we'll get to this in a minute too, but like it's a language. the languages that they speak in Nier's world are highly, highly evolved. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, this goes to towards the, um, the another um, um, kind of note about the development of the game. When, when they were making the music, they got this woman yes. to um, help write the songs, and mm -hmm. basically what they were saying, they said, hey, we want you to write kind of like a Frenchish, Irish, Germany type sounding song, but but imagine this language as though it were 1,300 years in the future. Yeah, and how and would the language change? How would it have evolved? Yeah. And so the music has, and it's fascinating to listen to the music, it, it sounds like you're hearing real normal words but but They're but not. but you don't know what you're hearing like mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense grammatically in any way but but it sounds so familiar and they did yes. a really good job with that in the music and but that's similar to what you're talking about there are other cultures um, that we're not going to get into in the, in the summary of what we played this time but next yeah. time for sure other cultures that speak Very this really funky different. language yes um, and like even even like when you write so how you save the game right there's the mailboxes and you, it, the idea is that uh, Nier is away from Yona for long periods of time working. Yes. And so he writes letters back. And so that's kind of like the save system. It's like yeah. he's writing a letter of his progress and sending it to Yona. Yeah. And, but like, and she'll send it You'll back. notice that like, as you stand in front of that box, there's like a little envelope that like goes into the yeah. slot. And there's like symbols that fall yeah. off of the, the envelope. Yeah. Like these, these symbols, these letters. Um, also, when you kill shades, they have this very strange sort of like vocalize, vocalization, a sound, like a yeah. kind of jumble, like bleh, 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 I can't even make it. It's, but when they die, they have this really strange language that they speak. Yeah. Now. Maybe I'll talk more about this when we get to Grimoire Vice yeah. because there, there's, there's some interesting stuff there. Yeah. And, and the stuff with the Grimoires too. So, yeah. But, but my point in bringing all this up is that there seems to be, to me, a very intentional, like, use of language yeah. to sort of establish an otherness or a strangeness or a weirdness okay, yeah. to different cultures hmm. in Nier or, or just to different life forms in Nier. Right. And this is one of like the, the biggest barriers when you're learning a new language, right? To understanding 
what people are really intending to say to yeah, you. Yeah, because sometimes the technical words are not indicative of the yeah. meaning. You might yeah. understand the words, mm -hmm. but you're missing the intent because right. you're not familiar enough with the culture exactly. of the place. Like if I say, ha, now the shoe's on the other foot. <laughs> and if in English you get it, right? Yeah. But if you were just coming to English from a country that doesn't have that type of right. analogy where the walk-in shoes or walk into my own someone's shoes, um, you you just aren't going to get it. You're going to understand the exact words and you're going to be like, what, what shoe were you talking about? Yeah. And this is actually, throughout all human history, been such a key to why cultures or tribes clash with mm -hmm. each other, especially when their cultures are really different. Yeah. There's a sense, like I said, of otherness strangeness, something is wrong mm -hmm. with those people. Yeah. They're not like me. And it's easy to separate them. Yes. And from your, to justify your, yeah. tribal wars sure. or whatever Anything. it might be, conflicts whatever over land. Interests. Because they uh -huh. are not like us. Yeah. They're strange. They're weird. And mm -hmm. language and culture are like intrinsically tied yeah. into viewing another culture as different from me. To be uh, s mm -hmm. To be separate, to, to, to I don't know how to describe it. Um, but I know what you mean. It's the other in group and out group. Yes. And the, the concept of the other. Yes. Right? There's a bunch of, and they do a very good job with the near of radically changing the cultures from one place to the next. Yes. Whether you're at the Erie or at Seaside or wherever, it's, it is very different. To, they live completely differently. To sort of intrinsically establish. Um, a mistrust yeah. between both sides yes. of each other. Which they right? do a very good job of, by the way. So that's something I want to bring up and yeah. like just to kind of pay attention to as we play. And I think you might be able to, because you know so many languages, you have such a hobby yeah. of studying and learning languages that right. I have not done. And so there's probably a lot there that I won't pick up on necessarily that maybe you will. Which is why I think it's good that I'm playing the Japanese, <laughs> the Japanese version, version and you're playing the English version. Right. Yeah. So keep that in mind while you're playing as well. But, uh, and, and, I, and like you said, bringing up the vocalist, um, Evie, uh, uh, or Emmy Evans. What was her name? Okay. Emmy Evans, she, she is like the singer for a lot of yeah, music in this. Beautiful movie. voice. And <laughs> yeah, oh, divine. I yeah, love very her voice. Good. It's very it's good. absolutely amazing. Yeah. But yeah, she was, she wrote the lyrics and she did ones that sound Japanese, but yes. they aren't Japanese. I know, that's the weirdest thing that to listen to. <laughs> French, that aren't French. <laughs> yeah. And ones, you know, so she did a really good job of mm -hmm. this. And so the way that language is used to establish differences of culture, otherness, strangeness mm -hmm. to these other people, yeah. is I think a really important piece of the puzzle of th Nier's thematic core. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay, so let's begin with the summary. Now we're done with the dev history. Yeah. Let's begin with the summary of what we played this time. So All right. we're gonna talk about the hook, which I think is phenomenal in this game, a really good hook. Yeah. Uh, but the game actually starts in either summer 2049 or I guess summer, summer 2053. 2053. Yeah, um, not that that number makes any difference as far as I know. Yeah, and so it's a, post-apocalyptic kind yeah. of setting and world. You're in Tokyo, because it shows you, by the end the camera kind of pans up and you see Tokyo Tower in the distance. Yeah. So that's the reveal, you're in Tokyo. Okay, so quick addendum here. As I was editing the video, I was trying to find the shot that Kaysen was referring to with Tokyo Tower, and I, and I couldn't find it. Because in the English version of the game, the the final shot of the prologue sort of pans around and shows the Empire State Building, not Tokyo Tower. And I was like, wait a minute, is this a difference between the versions? So I just quickly looked up a near replicant uh, playthrough online, and sure enough, it does show the Tokyo Tower in the Japanese version, but it shows the Empire State Building in the English version. So near Gestalt, I guess, is taking place in New York City, and near replicant is taking place in Tokyo. So I, I don't know. It, it was kind of just a funny th difference between the versions. Um, I'm sure that they weren't necessarily uh, tying this into lore as much as just trying to show 
a recognizable landmark for English speaking people versus a recognizable landmark for Japanese people. Just to show that this is this post apocalyptic, uh, near future setting that they were in. Um, and Japanese people would recognize, ooh, this is happening in Tokyo. And, you know, everyone else, ooh, that's in New York City. So, kind of an interesting little difference between the two there. Also, and this is, this is what really blew my mind too. Somebody, uh, like, I noticed this while I was watching the replicant version of the cutscene. There was just a one frame little blip. And I was like, oh, was that a mistake? in the YouTube upload or, you know, I, I could, I could tell that there was a one frame blip in the replicant cutscene when it shows Tokyo tower in the distance, but then, uh, seven wings in my discord server, as I was editing this video, right in the stream said that there was apparently a shot of Angelus, the dragon from dragon guard impaled on Tokyo tower in the replicant version of the cutscene that was not in the gestalt version of the cutscene. And so we were looking at that one frame, that one little blip frame, and sure enough, yes, there's like a one frame shot when it shows Tokyo Tower out there in the distance where it shows Angelus, the dragon from Drakengard, impaled on Tokyo Tower, which was part of Drakengard's E ending, which is something that Kaysen and I mentioned uh, as the, the tie between Drakengard and and near obviously so yeah a couple of key differences small but key differences between the gestalt version of the prologue and the replicant version of the prologue nuts we have oh, either wait, wait 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 the start screen oh yes you're right hold on Let's hold on there. before you even start <laughs> this is the craziest thing because this was almost something of a hook in and of itself yeah with the game yeah now when you first start up the game what do you hear well Vice, you dumbass! Start making sense, you rotten book, or you're gonna be sorry. Maybe I'll rip your pages out one by one, or maybe I'll put you in the goddamn furnace. How can someone with such a big smart brain get hypnotized like a little bitch, huh? Oh, Shadow Lord, I love you, Shadow Lord. Come over here and give Vice a big sloppy kiss, Shadow Lord. Now pull your head out of your goddamn ass and start fucking helping us! In the English version, yeah. you have a line from Kaine. I wish I had written it down so that I could, like, pick out things in it but well i i i know the line that it's referring to later on in the game right because yeah I, I would i would assume that this line in japanese is still in the japanese version they it just is. didn't use it on the start screen they just the didn't way. do that yeah yeah but when you start the game up i mean it just comes up and and she's screaming at you have vice, no clue <laughs> she's just screaming yeah. at him like you know you've been possessed by the shadow lord she's like mocking him or making fun of him for this yeah like pull your head out of your butt and like help us right. is more or less like what she's screaming at him to do yes a very uh, profanity it's, it's, laced it's laden <laughs> laden with profanity and yes. expletives right so i i yeah. there's there is a part of that that i think i agree is kind of like oh a hook because it's, it's a very strong it's like what kind of game is this declaration of the yeah adult nature the of the adultness, game. The adultness, exactly. And it just a very, very, very uh, intense opening, th the first interaction with what the game is like. Okay, exactly. okay, that was intense, what's this? Like, what the <laughs> what, what's going on here? <laughs> um, but they didn't have that. They did not have that in the Japanese version. So how does that one work? You just hit start and you start the game. <laughs> so does it does it play the same trailer? It does. It does still play the trailer. It just though. doesn't have her talking. It just does not have that line at the beginning. I don't know why the North American version branch of Square Enix decided, hey, let's put this We're rant We're going to lean here. really into this. Yes, <laughs> but it is not present in the Japanese version, and in part because that's not so good a hook in Japan. Mm. Japan, and this is where I can maybe, this is something we'll, t we'll reference many times throughout the game, Japan does not have swear words the way that English does. Like, mm. there are ways to say unacceptably rude things in Japanese, but it's not to the extent of, like, like a curse word, like you like a word of curse. Like you yeah. will be cursed if you use, or this is a word I use to curse you with. Like, yeah. you know, like it, it's, it's the Japanese doesn't have that the way English does given the Christian here's, history. Here's a great example of <laughs> languages and cultures yeah. being so different So different to where it's like, hey, we can't have, the, the Japanese version couldn't have They this. don't even have the same, the same. They don't even have the same concept. Uh, in their language of it's these expletives exactly. that we have. Well, they, but they do understand. I'll, we'll get into more of this later. It is fascinating, in my opinion, the way that they've dealt with um, 
profanity in the Japanese version of the game yeah. because they will bleep out words in Japanese. Hmm. They, they didn't in English, no. right? Okay, I didn't think so. <laughs> no. But they will bleep out words in Japanese to make it seem worse than it actually was, huh. or than it actually is. Because what she's saying is, yeah, it's horribly rude, it's very informal and, and direct speech, but but it's not, they don't bleep things out in Japanese like mm. that. Like, it just doesn't, it's, it's the whole sentence that's rude. It's not just the one word, you know? But yeah. they started bleeping things out for some of, of this character that we'll talk about later. Some of the things she says, there's literally a bleep happening. And it's like, I don't, they didn't do that in English, but they did in Japanese, which makes me think that they wanted it to be more profane than the Japanese language would allow them <laughs> <laughs> to do. So they put bleeps in so that people would think, oh my gosh, did she just, what did she just say? But in English, they just let it all out. Let just let like, go, it. all the profanity is perfectly, hmm. all. it's all a go. Weird, weird stuff, but that's what they decided to do in, in the localization. So I find that utterly, utterly fascinating. But at the very beginning, that speech is not at present in the Japanese version, and it just goes straight into that trailer. Yeah. And, and there is something of a speech in the trailer. That's all that's translated. That's crazy but and cool. Yeah, it's weird. About. I know, it's fascinating. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a different localization that I'm used to encountering. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, so that's the, the start screen. And then you, you open the game, you actually hit new game. You start, and I really liked this. I really liked this. It's a bunch of shots of what appears to be falling snow. It's just yes. white snow falling. But it says summer. And this is what I love about it. It's a black <laughs> screen. It's a black screen and it says 2049 in the version yeah. I played. And then it fades on after about a second. It, summer. But in front of after it. that. Yeah. I think that alone is an interesting hook. That's fascinating. It's like, why is it snowing? In well, the you would think like climate is change it or like what's yeah. going on? Like or, this or is, is it snow that exactly. we're even looking at? Like is it snow? Is the real question? What, what's <laughs> yeah. going on? Like the the this prologue is fantastic in my yeah. opinion. Um, so that's the first mystery that we're given. It's snowing, or it seems to be, and then twenty forty nine summer. And it's like, oh, it's snowing in the summer. Or is it snow? Or what's that? Okay, that's a mystery. Yeah. Then we go into this sort of like abandoned mall, and there's either an older man or a younger man there yeah. who's with... Kind of nodding off to sleep. Yeah. With the daughter or Yona. sister. Yona is the character. And they're kind of mm. caring for this sick girl. Yeah, she's right? coughing. Something's, you don't know what's up, but something's just not right yeah, about something's her. Something's not right. She's clearly like about to die. And there's a book there on the ground and yeah. he kicks it away and sort of curses this book. Yeah, not in Japanese, he doesn't. <laughs> it says, Konomono, uh, it just means this thing. He yeah. kicks it away. But in, in English, they were like, they inserted a few swear words and said, yeah. like, all right, you know, fair enough. So anyways, don't know what that book is. Okay, that's crazy. And then he tells her not to touch this book. I think there's actually two books. There are two. So books. there's there's well, there's a book so that's over near her, and then there's a book he kicked away him. from himself. So he kicks a book away from him, but there's another book that's over near. There's her. a different book by yeah. her. So there's two of these books with these faces on them. Yeah. And he tells her not to touch that book. Some shades appear, and he goes yeah. out to fight them. And this is where it gives but you. He doesn't. Yeah, he's not very. Well. He's not very good, right? Yeah, like it's he, he's he's struggling, and he gets hit back, and then he decides, okay, in order to protect. Yona, I have to use the power of this to, book. So yeah. he touches the book. The book gives him abilities, magical abilities. And this is the game's introduction of, uh, or tutorial, or sort of like gives you a taste, I guess, of the magic you're going to see later in the game. Because you level up super fast during this tutorial. It's so weird. Just bam, 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 I, level I think five, there's bam, an in game explanation 10. for that when we meet. Um, you know, later on. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I was like, what in the world? You're like level 30 before you know it. Yep. <laughs> like, is that really how this game's going to go? Having no idea. Yeah, yeah, that was, yeah. But was I crazy. think the, the, I guess the purpose of this, you, like the utilitarian story purpose of this, or, or maybe you can even say just the game design purpose of this, mm -hmm. is to give the player a sense, like a promise, as to like right. what this gameplay is going to evolve into yeah. later. So With it's just, magic you're and, getting a taste of how yeah. the magic and the combat will work, and it's giving, you, it's giving you kind of like this just really quick introduction to like all yeah. of it at once. Yeah. And I think it's really effective because it's like, I oh, so. I can do this magic I and I can so. do this type of magic. Oh, that's yeah. going to be cool and this is this awesome. This big and hand <laughs> comes out of the ground and just, just 
punches your enemies like straight up. And then you get like the spears and then you get like the, just the little kind yeah, of bullets the, that you shoot. Arrows, and, yeah. um, and so it's sort of introducing you and, and then you get to even like where you hold uh, the attack button down and then he can do yeah, like bigger and you can swipes. target multiple enemies or something. Yeah, yeah. so there, it kind of introduces you to like all the combat in this really compressed little tutorial section, yeah. which I thought was really cool. Like it yeah. did a really good job of establishing where the combat system is going. Because obviously it's gonna take a while for us when the game really starts to level up to that level and to gain all those abilities over time. Yeah. So they sort of just show you like what you're in for right at the beginning. Yeah. Again, another really good tactic as a hook into like the gameplay side of it. But then... Story-wise, it's a pretty <laughs> compelling hook as yes, well. <laughs> yes, these books that give you these powers. Yeah. But then he fights off all the shades, and he goes back in, and Yona yeah. had touched the book, and she has this... And she's like, oh, and, I, oh, I want to protect you kind of thing. This is the other area where yeah. their language could somehow be worked into the theme. The, this black scrawl, That's this what they're disease, the black scrawl. but it's actually like symbols. It's like yeah, characters. It's writing. Black writing yeah. that is sort of like infecting her arm or yeah. her body, right? So there's like a language written. It's like words are like scrawled in black across her arm. And this happened because she touched the book. She well, here's the thing. So at the very beginning, as the scene is starting, uh, at the beginning of this scene, before you fight the shades, you're hearing a voice. There's a voice talking to you that says, hey, I can make you powerful. Mm. I can make you strong. All I require in return is your soul. And that's mm. when he wakes up and he kicks the book away. The Good idea point. being that book was talking to him saying, give me your soul and I'll help you fight. Yes. And then when you come back in after fighting with the book and you come up to Yona and it turns out she's touched the book that was near her, which by the way, I don't know why that book was right next to her. He was like, don't touch the book, Yona. And it's like four feet from her. <laughs> if like right you've thing. been around a kid and you tell them not to do something they're and you leave, they're going to do it. Just I don't, kick the book away. Get it away. <laughs> get it somewhere else. But the, the idea, at least in my mind, was that book was likely talking to her the same yeah. way that the other book was talking to, uh, to Nier. And so she, because her words, as soon as he comes back and says, did you touch the book? She goes, well, I thought that maybe I could help protect you also. Like, mm -hmm. I'm so weak, you're always protecting me. I want to become strong too. That book was promising her that she could become strong in exchange for her soul. So they both kind of did similar things, except um, her fate was, well, yeah. we don't actually know we what happens. We don't know because yet, but something. They both, or well, Nier is just like, no, and it's like this awful scene, and the camera just fades to white, and then. And then we, we go yeah. to a time jump that is insane. 1,312 years into the future. What the heck? It's like, wait a minute. <laughs> it's like what? an arbitrary number almost. And not only is it over a thousand years in the future, yeah. it's the same the characters. The same two people. And, and she's still sick. And he's still caring for her. And he's still her. caring for her. And it's, yeah. and it's just like, what? That's weird it stuff. Is what? <laughs> What's going on? That is a great hook. I think it's a very good really hook. Really good mystery. You don't want to just stop playing the game no, when that like, happens. No, it's like, now i got to find out you what's gotta going on. you got to figure this out. I, I think yeah. it's one of the most effective prologues I've ever seen in a game. And yeah, even, when I, even when I played this like back in 2015, I think, or something, the first time I picked it up, because somebody suggested it. Um, that I do a first look episode on it back when I used to oh, do those. Oh, yeah. So I did, I played the game a lot uh, for that first look episode, but then I, w I couldn't just stop playing it because it was like, <laughs> that's crazy. That prologue was so effective, yeah. right? And here's the thing, and this is kind of something I want to touch on too, is that Nier is criticized. It was not like a... a, a a critical darling, let's say, mm. back in 2010. Right. Um, the gameplay is a little rough yeah. and repetitive and not the deepest action combat that there is, mm. especially since Nier was uh, one of the influences for Taro was God of War, right? He really oh, liked yeah. God of War. Yeah. And so they kind of like used God of War as an influence. But God of War 3 came out like a month before Nier did, and God of War is obviously a much more polished action C game clearly, than yes. Nier is, right? Yeah. So and we'll see. Maybe they're polishing up the gameplay for this. Uh, they are. That's so good. By the time this releases, it will be out, and I'm mm -hmm. going to buy the remastered replicant version and play oh, cool. that so that we can make some comparisons okay, nice. to how they play. So that'll be in the next episode. But the point is, is that Nier 
is not necessarily the the most well designed action RPG of all time. Yeah. But if you compare it to Drakengard, it's a huge <laughs> step forward. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think so. <laughs> if you played Automata and you're coming back to Nier, it might be a little rougher. Yeah. That I'm of course I'm I'm speaking only to the PS3 version I'm playing, not to the PS4 and 5 version that's coming oh, out okay, now. Right, right. I will speak on that next time because I haven't played it yet, obviously. No. But point is, despite the fact that the game is not the most polished action RPG of all time, I still find that it's it, it's definitely competent. And I think that the boss mm. fights in particular are pretty good. They're very, they clearly put a lot of thought into the boss fights. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they just kind of let the normal gameplay be, be what it is. It's but. fighting normal shades is pretty repetitive yeah. and it's not that fun. But the bosses are at least pretty good. They're I think that that's something you can creative. look forward to. Yeah. But, anyways, we come out of this hook of uh, the prologue and you come outside of the home where, where uh, Nier and Yona live, yeah. and things seem to be relatively okay. It's pretty peaceful, right? Like, yeah, except it's like a medieval. Time. It's like a medieval. <laughs> this society. is thirteen hundred years in the future, yeah. and we have uh, humanity has regressed, has yeah. not progressed at all. People are living in, um, you know, thatched roof houses. And yep. it's like Stone it's like twelve hundred AD. It's what it feels like. Yeah, and so you're, you're in this little village, right? Um, just kind of a small village, and there's a library there that has records or books kept from. Yeah. Now the library looks impressive. Thousands of years ago. Yeah. And that was a, a library huge, built a long time ago. Huge library. So it sort yeah. of retained knowledge from like the previous yeah. civilization. That Although was if you talk to a lot of the characters in the library, they're constantly like they'll say things like, um, I, "I wish I could understand the books." Like they're yeah. all written in a weird language that mm. I can't understand. Which is again the hint that. The language they're speaking is evolved. Yeah, it's all a changed. thousand years from yeah. what it used to be. Yeah, um, and for context, English a thousand years ago, you would not have understood. not right. Old English is unreadable. <laughs> like maybe written, yeah, but but everything was spelled differently, and they were all pronounced differently, and like mm -hmm. it is, it is totally different. Yeah, the you, syntax, the grammar, everything was different. Completely different language, almost old yeah. English. You, you would get, sit there. You might pick out one or two words every. Like page, or even something. even Every Middle English. Ten minutes of talking. Even Middle English, which yeah. is closer, is still of the French. It's French. still really hard to pick out. Yeah, very. It's hard. not until you get to like uh, early modern English, the Shakespearean. Yeah, the, the Sha and the King and James. The King James. Yeah, that that's where it's like. Even still, it's it's still hard. It's, but it's, it's hard. Not too hard. If you haven't read it a lot. Yeah. But like, you can at least follow it. You can at least yeah. sound out the words and. <laughs> Exactly. And read it with some level of comfort. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? But that was only, what, 400 or 500 Four years ago? 500 years ago, yeah. So anything, basically anything before like 1500 in English is, is really hard to understand. So we're talking 1300 years in the future. Yeah. So this, this language has evolved yeah. a ton. It, yeah. it would be unrecognizable. Yeah. Um, and this is something that I really love about this opening town. I don't know if you noticed this. Uh, it's playing like kind of a, an acoustic guitar. Mm -hmm. Little thing. Yeah, like a lute. Yeah. And, and and it's kind of playing that. But there's a character named Devola who's yeah. sitting in, I don't know what you'd call it, like a little circular. She's by a fountain. What would you call it? Yeah, like it's like the fountain. town square. I would just say it's like the town center. And she's sitting there and she's got like a lute or yeah. guitar ish looking instrument. And when you approach her singing like words, a, a vocalist yeah. sort of like. Fades, fades into, into that music seamlessly, yeah. and, and it's, it's like it's yeah. like she Devola is singing the yeah, song. Yeah, yeah. So they kind of make it like so. It's a like diegetic. diegetic and non. It's like both. Yes. Depending. Yeah, that's cool. If you're if you're away from her, the theme is yeah. there, or the I guess the background track is there. But if you're within mm. her vicinity, the full version of the piece comes in with the vocals, nice. and it's like Devola is singing this song, and the song itself is a diegetic piece of the lore of the yeah. game. And it they, is the song the lyrics, of the ancients, yeah, yeah. right? Which uh, we'll get into in a minute. But she's singing a song about this old civilization. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's Devola, the character who's actually singing it. With, and e Emmy Evans, like we said, is the, is the um, vocalist for yeah. the game. She wrote those lyrics. And, and when you first mm -hmm. hear it, you're like, 
what is she saying? I know. <laughs> you're like trying to. And like, you're trying to understand. And I swear every now and then you can pick out a full word or it two. It seems like it, yeah. And, but, but you don't know what it's saying. You don't mm -hmm. know what, what the theme is or anything. And it's so cool. This is my favorite track from the game. Oh, beautiful, yeah. And the, the music as a whole in Nier is so phenomenal. Yeah, and it's, it's so distinct and unique and it creates this absolutely just ultra distinct identity for Nier. You yeah. hear Nier music, you know oh, it's yeah. Nier. It's and, and in part because of how often you hear it, and this might yeah. actually be a little negative <laughs> tick, because a lot of that music, and it's the same woman who wrote a bunch of different tracks, and you, you hear this music over and over, and it is, luckily, it is beautiful, beautiful music. <laughs> it is very, very easy on the ears. Yeah. But it is, um, it does get a, a bit repetitive, and there, there's not a huge variance in the type of music you hear throughout the game. Yeah. It's all kind of this same style of song. Yeah. Yeah, but it's very good. Yeah, so I, I really liked that. I thought it was a really, a really cool way to work town theme and yeah. make it a diegetic piece yeah, of the Yeah, there's world. someone literally in town just playing the guitar. Yeah. If and you go into the bar, she's, she's sometimes she's in the bar playing her, her Yeah, music. and the song itself is like a history or like a, yeah. it's like a prophecy almost. Yeah, yeah. For this world, right? So, really cool. Okay, so... Devola, the person playing the music, has a yeah. sister, Popola. Popola, yeah. And they're she's, kind of, she's in the library. They're kind of like the the matrons, or maybe that's not the right word. They, they sort of like leaders of yeah, this Yeah, they kind town. of run things, more or less. They're just yeah. kind of in charge. Yeah. And in particular, Popola. Popola Devola seems to be more. seems to, be le to care less about yeah, that. Yeah. And Popola, she, you go to the library and she usually gives you jobs. Yes. So near, whether you're the brother character or the father character, in providing for Yona uh, does kind of a lot of odd jobs, a lot of dangerous work. Yeah, yeah. Involved with hunting or mm -hmm. um, fighting off shades or whatever it is to protect this village. Yeah. And in return, you know, they, you know, they let him live there with her and... Uh, they, you know, they'll, you'll, you'll get paid. That's kind of how yeah, money works money. in the game too. Yeah. You, you uh, do these odd jobs and people will pay you a thousand or, you know, gold here and there. So you go into the library, you usually report to Popola, she gives you jobs. You know, like kind of essentially gives you the missions that you're going to be undertaking for this first part of the game for part one, right? Yeah. Um, so, you, you know, you go out and you hunt sheep and you do kind of odd jobs for the people in the town. They give you money, uh, things like that. But kind of at the end of that first day, you go back in and, and, you, and Yona's waiting for you. And, oh, this is something that I really liked about the save system, right? The idea is that, like I said earlier, you're writing letters to Yona yeah. as a means that of like cool. recording that progress. Cool. Because he goes away so often from town, he's gone yeah. on these jobs. Yeah. And so she's alone at home. And so like Popola and Devola will look after her, but like she looks forward to getting these letters back from her dad. And that's kind of like how the, it's a really adorable kind of way of I, having a save system. I, yeah, I love their, their relationship. The relationship's it's, it's, awesome. It's very, very convincing. But uh, so, he goes back there for the night and she's waiting for him and, and he tells her a story about these lunar tears, a, a, yeah. a flower. Something important story-wise though, while she's at the library, she's telling him first. She says, hey, uh, I read a really cool book about a tree, because you kind of see oh, her at right. the library, and because um, you're like, what are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here. Go back home. Go lay down and rest because <laughs> yeah. we're concerned about her health, not mm -hmm. so much whether she's living you know, the, a great life at the moment or not. It's all about just stay alive, right? And yeah. so um, she finds a book that talks of something about a, a great tree, and mm -hmm. it's a really exciting book that she says that she found at the library. Anyways, we basically ignore her. <laughs> We're just like, hold on, hold on. I'm going to tell you a story instead, and that's mm -hmm. where this story kind of comes this about. This lunar, lunar flower. The lunar flower. The lunar, lunar tear. tear. Yeah. And so, Wait, are we playing another game with a lunar tear? With yes, a lunar we, cry? We, another lunar, a lunar, lunar cry. Yep. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Anyways. Back to back. So he... What I like about that scene is he plants, uh, this is a setup, he plants the idea about the lunar tear. He just thinks yeah. he's reciting some ancient myth as a bedtime story, yes. right? He doesn't think anything of it. But yeah. she gets the idea that it's real. Like, mm -hmm. oh, if I find one of these lunar tears, I can make a wish and be healed yeah. of my illness and then dad won't have to worry about me. Exactly. Anymore. It's, it's a, kind of an altruistic thing. She's not so much worried about herself. She's yeah. worried about her, what her brother keeps having to go through in order to yeah. help her. Yeah. And she wants that to stop. Right. And she says, I think later on in the game, um, within this section, I believe, um, she's 
saying like, hey, brother, promise you won't go do anything dangerous. Yeah. And you're like, I promise. Yeah. No. <laughs> Total lie. But, Definitely going to. But yeah. she really does care about you, and she she's trying to protect you in, in her own way. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, she goes to Popolo the next day while while Nier is off doing a job mm. and asks about this lunar tier and where it can be found, and Popolo doesn't think anything of it and tells her, oh, at the, yeah. the Lost Shrine or whatever, they kind yeah, of grow oh, they're, around they're that over area. They're over there, yeah. And so Yona's like, yoop de doo I'm going over to the, this dangerous Apparently, Lost Shrine to find yeah. a lunar tier. And we come back and find out she's gone. I'm like, oh crap, she went to the Lunar Shrine. Yeah. Go running after her. And so this is kind of the first dungeon or level of yeah. the game, right? You fight all the way up to the top of this. And somehow tower. she got all the way to the top of that tower. <laughs> I, don't know I would, how she I did would it. assume she got captured somewhere Earlier along on. the way and yeah. then taken up there. Because right? when we finally get there, she's like laying on an altar. It's like a yeah. religious looking temple type yeah. like place with this big corridor hall. And at the very end of it, there's something of a shrine, and she's laying down like on an altar. Yeah. But in front of that is like these two guard statues, and in, in the, the middle, middle of it a is book. a book. Yeah. The book we kind saw of from the prologue. Suspended, exactly. That uh, Nier used to fight off all those shades, right? Yes, a very powerful book indeed. So he wants to break through, but he can't, but he hits it, hits it, hits it, and then eventually this book starts talking, right? It, yeah, like, like this stop, is, this stop is like me. <laughs> the secondary protagonist of the game, yes. uh, Grimoire Vice. Grimoire Vice. Is uh, this book that can talk and, and uh, offers yeah. near magical powers to help him. So an important thing is that you're kind of smacking at this barrier and the, the uh, Nier's like desire to save his daughter at any and all costs necessary. Yes. It shows here because he, um, a normal person shouldn't have been able to kind of break through that seal. But he was able to, and not only that, he knocks Grimoire Vice back and on the ground, and that is the pretext for Grimoire Vice saying that he's lost his memories. Yeah. He doesn't remember, he's like, oh, ever since you hit me really hard, <laughs> I kind of don't remember like all my old, I don't remember the spells, I don't remember how to do magic, I don't remember the history, I don't, I don't remember anything anymore. Yes. And so he follows us and as we level up, he slowly remembers more and more and then he can do more of the magic that we saw at the beginning of the game in the right. prologue. But yeah, so Grimoire Vice. Now he is, I looked this, so, so in Japanese it's um, Shiro no Sho, which is white book. That's what mm, I mean. The white, white book, book. yeah. And then that's interesting because we learn, you know, a little bit later on here about another book called Grimoire Noir. Which is the and black Noir book. is the black book. Uh, and Kuro no Sho. And so Sho is a like a kind of a suffix in Japanese. It can mean any written document, basically anything that's written. Uh, but in this case, clearly it's a book. So he is the white book. And I think it's fascinating that they didn't translate it. This is one of the, I'm going to talk about this a lot as we go. It was one of the times where I'm like, why didn't they just translate it into white book in English? It's translated into Grimoire Weiss, which is German. Uh, Weiss meaning white, and mm. Noir is also German and French, and you know, for white. Um, or black. Or black, yeah, yeah, black. And Grimoire is like a book, like a memoir, like the word more is kind of yeah. like a book, and then Grim meaning um, something along the lines of magic, like an, a spell of yeah, incantations, like a, a, right? A, kind of a tome of, yeah, like a of tome, spells. Yeah, yeah. and so Grimoire Weiss, that means they're, heady, they're, they're pushing us in this heavy Germanic direction, kind yeah. of. And I think there are a few other words that I'm, I may be forgetting now, but it's it's seeming very German here, and that's what they're looking to go for. Um, whereas in the Japanese, it's it's just plain Japanese. There is no other culture influence on the vocabulary. The, it's the, just the terms white the books book and black books are yeah. Japanese terms. Yeah, they they Japanese. don't use any other. Yeah, so I found that to be super interesting. interesting. Um, but that just kind of shows. Um, yeah. How the extent they went to in the localization for this game was was pretty far Intense, reaching, I think. Yeah. Pretty good. Yeah, yeah so, so uh, Grimoire, Vice, uh, and Nier sort of uh, ally. Yeah. You fight against those, uh, the statue those guardian things, yeah. statue things. And some other shades, yeah. Um, I thought that was a pretty cool fight 
personally, in comparison, to especially to all the fights leading up that tower, which is just like smack, 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 smack. <laughs> the shades. Dodge I know. once in a while, block once in a while, smack, smack. But smack, every smack, now smack, and smack. then, even there, once you enter a room and the camera goes to a top-down yeah, view, yeah. and it kind of feels more like an old SNES it style up a game. Bit. Yeah, really cool. I love how they, they do that. They do do a good job of that. They do a yeah. really good job in this game of one pacing, like the length of dungeons versus the length of cutscenes yeah, versus sure. the amount of dialogue people yeah. say. Games, especially RPGs in the modern era, have just become hyper, super, absurdly inflated with dialogue. You yes. go talk to an NPC and they have like yeah. seven pages of dialogue <laughs> <laughs> instead of like well, you, you one mentioned that. sentence or two. Um, and that's how it used to be, right? Yeah. I just recently played Fantasian as well, which oh, is, that's right. which is Hiro Sakaguchi and Mistwalker. Yeah, Mistwalker. Game. And that's one of the things I loved about that game yeah. is that you talk to an NPC, they will say one or maybe two things to you. Here's what you need to that know. That is it, and yeah. then you can move on. Because you also <laughs> played Project Triangle Strategy, as did I. Yes. And and that they was, you know, it's a lot of it's skippable. And talk. But people and like you and I aren't going to skip. <laughs> important things yeah, of game related something, story something stuff. Important. So here we are most of the time just sitting down listening to people talk like the whole time. Just fetching, won't yeah, shut up. Crazy. We'll not stop talking. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this game has a really good balance and yes. in part because they save a lot of the dialogue for while you're fighting. Yeah. So and it's, sometimes it's important, mm. important stuff. So instead of having a cutscene or an anime style like, ooh, this is why I'm doing this, and here I will use this attack against you now, and and yeah. it's like the the monologue, what do you call it, soliloquy kind of style that a lot of RPGs kind of yeah. see. Um, mm. In this game, you just you start fighting, and Grimoire or anybody who happens to be in your party uh, or who maybe who you're fighting against, in the top left of the screen you'll see their name and some text and it's voice acted, it's fully voice acted. And so they're they're just talking to you about stuff. So while you're fighting, Grimoire Vice is like, I'm an all powerful, <laughs> are you kidding me? You'd address me by my full name. Yeah, yeah. Grimoire Vice and you, I am the most powerful, I'm a god among books. And you're like, can you like do something? And he's like, <laughs> I've quite forgotten how to uh, Good banter use my them. powers. Yes, mm. and that is something that was taken straight from Drakengard. Yeah, because in Drakengard, with the gameplay, the dragon, a Angelus or Angelus, yeah. and Kaim, they are having that same kind of banter back mm, and forth. Right. So while Kaim is Kaim is slaughtering tons of people, uh, Angelus is just like you're Commenting freaking crazy. <laughs> like humans are bloodthirsty, and of course they. Well, maybe I shouldn't give anything away about Drakengard now, um, but. The banter is fascinating, and we get some of that same banter in Nier, where Grimoire Vice is like, "Like you, you humans are so fascinating. Like you're so willing to do this or that. I don't understand you. Why?" Uh, there was a there's a point I think later on where he says, "How come you humans don't think for yourselves? Why are you asking someone else for help?" Yeah, and he's like a book of knowledge, right? Yeah. So he can obviously just look within himself to find answers, sure. whereas humans kind of need help, you know. Right. But he's just making fun of Nier and how Nier likes to do side quests and help people and get people meat and stuff. And Grimoire Vice is like, "I'll never understand you." Yeah. But that dialogue is delivered during battle or while you're while just you're running doing a, from place a to side place. Side quest. Yeah. Or moving. So it's less of a cutscene, and it's more of, well, we're not doing anything anyways. May as well throw in some dialogue yeah. here. And I really, li I wish more games would do. That. Really good I really point. like it because it keeps the pace. It keeps moving. the pace. Yeah, like perfect. the pace of yeah. Nier is like spot on to me. Yeah, I think so. Like it just, I never feel like, oh, this dungeon's too long, or this cutscene just goes on forever, yeah. or <laughs> it's just like yeah. it's always moving, and it's it's very aware of when it's time to move to the next thing. And that's rare in RPGs, I find. I think things. so. I think, I think it's so. really rare. Yeah. So I, I think there's our RPGs really are well. so exposition laden and so, yeah. so um, usually, which is why we play them, but story driven yeah. mm -hmm. that it's it's like reading a book sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyways, uh, you rescue Yona and you bring her back to town. And I, I wrote this down, and I'm, I'm not sure how to feel about this either. This was initially a criticism, but as I've thought about it more, I'm like, oh, I wonder, mm -hmm. I wonder how, I wonder what Devil is really. I'm, maybe I'm thinking, maybe I'm overanalyzing <laughs> too much. What? But you go to Devola, and she's like, that's Grimoire Vice? Yeah. That's so cool. Wait, you're Grimoire Vice? Oh, that is so cool. What? <laughs> what? Okay, so you, if you, if you see a legendary god talking book that flies, and your response is, whoa, that's cool. This is, okay, there's a couple things I'll pack in this. It's a really weird response for a couple reasons. One, yeah. the song she's singing, 
is about is, a white is book. It's about a white book exactly. defeating. It's, it's essentially the prophecy of like the end times of this world. Exactly. She's singing this All, music. That's like what she does. That's the song <laughs> of her. And she's like, Grimoire Vice, that's so cool. That would be like <laughs> if John the Revelator like walked in and I and you were like, <laughs> Oh, John the Revelator. John, yeah, That's about, so dope. I read about you. Yeah. Oh, sick, man. Instead Dang. of like, that can't be right. Yeah. That's, that's there's no way that's real. My eyes deceive me. This is just a myth. Or if you do believe in it, being like, oh, that can't. Wait a minute. Or, or if you really did believe it, let's yeah. say you were convinced there was evidence enough to be, that's legitimately John the Revelator or Moses or something. Yeah. It's like holy, holy crap. Like I don't even know how to respond to this. I don't know yeah. how to treat you. I, I don't know what to do. That's so cool is the last thing I would expect <laughs> someone to say <laughs> who has any familiarity with what Grimoire right. Vice and, represents. And she knows more better than basically anyone. Or she should. Her and Popola. Because she also how says... How important this cause, is. Because Nier asks for more clarification on the song. So he's like, well, what's that song about? And she's like, well, I don't she's really like, I, understand it. Because it's a different sing. language, right, that right. she doesn't speak anymore, yeah. So but she does know a little bit, and she tells she, you. She has to know, she knows enough to recognize yeah. Grimoire Vice, but she, so I can't decide how I feel about this line, yeah. because is she just, like, passingly familiar with the names, and because Popola has told her the story before, she kind of knows right. it, but she doesn't really care that much? <laughs> or, based on what we know about this character for later, is she, like, pretending to be naive about it like it's hard to say yeah but either way it strikes me as very strange <laughs> that the reaction <laughs> to seeing this legendary figure uh, of of myth and prophecy and to say oh that's so cool that's so cool <laughs> <laughs> really really strange and not only that she like knows like who he is anyways really interesting stuff grimoire is kind of floating there he listens to her song as you're leaving, he's like, wow, it's interesting that that song's really catchy. Yeah. It's interesting that, um, or maybe that's why it survived this long, basically. It's that this song is from 1,300 years ago, and it's still being sung today. Oh, it must be because it's a really catchy tune, right? Yeah. That's something to just kind of uh, keep in mind, I guess, because like we're going to keep um, coming back to Devil and Popola are the people we always keep coming back to. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you can talk to anyone in the village, but they're the ones that say new and different things like over and over and over, right? Yeah. So they're like our hub access point and stuff. And so, um, yeah, her reaction I found to be kind of ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, it was weird. And totally made no sense, especially because her whole life is singing this song. As far as we know, yeah. her whole life is, yeah. I sing this song in the town center. <laughs> and the manifestation of the song is in front of me now. And yeah. She doesn't think it's as big a deal as, as anyone else would have. And the townspeople, because of some other stuff that happens later, they, they really try to protect their town. You know, they, they do a really good job of protecting it from any outside influence, right? Yeah. And that includes, you know, different people, I guess. Uh, like we we're gonna talk about Kaine uh, pretty soon here, um, but they don't let her in town. <laughs> like they don't want her in their town. But they're okay with this floating talking book. Anyways, there's some weird inconsistencies yeah. with how they kind of manage the town. Yeah, yeah. But you go talk to Popola. She's she, a little more surprised. Yes, but and, still nowhere near where she should be. And she even says. Oh, but this is just a legend, though. Like, this isn't, like, Yeah, but real. here's the talking book. I know, that right? flies right next to me. And he mentions <laughs> yeah. it up. He's like, well, Grimoire Vice is real He's enough. Real, so it's got to be real, right? So the rest of the legend must be real. I don't know. That's a, maybe not... It's a bit of a logical fallacy. It's a bit of a fallacy there. But, <laughs> hey, you know, he's got a point. He, there is some sure, evidence that, that this may be At least real. take it a little more seriously than you might have before. Exactly. But, Popola doesn't really want to. But Popola definitely, like, well, she explains the whole legend of the the black and the white book and the white book like in you know i don't know what you call it it's prophecy of the white book defeating the black book yes and and, and, and so saving humanity right what what near gathers from this story is that these uh powers which are called sealed verses ah yes which I think we got mm. one, didn't we? From when we beat the statues, that we got a sealed verse or something like I, that? I, I don't remember if it was from the statues or it was from the second boss, which is in the airy, that you get the first okay. sealed verse. Okay, but yeah. essentially yeah, it's I like, I have, to re I have to reclaim these sealed verses to, yeah. un like to reach my full powers. Well, and because Grimoire Vice doesn't really quite remember yes. exactly what to do or how to do it. Yes. So they're like, hey, we got to So they get him. they gather the sealed verses, and this is going to restore yeah. Grimoire Vice's yeah. knowledge and give near greater powers 
in proxy because yes. Vice is giving him the powers to fight. Yeah. And then you're going to have the power to destroy the Black Book and uh, essentially erase the scrawl, the black, the black scrawl, scrawl the disease, from the yeah. world and save Yoda. Yeah. So this becomes Nier's primary motivation in the game. We're going to go find all the sealed verses, restore them to Vice. Vice will give me the power to kill Noir and yes. I will save Yoda. Yes. Now we have like the premise of the story of, yeah, from the, the character's motivation. The character's motivation. Yep, it's all story. right there. So that's essentially like what part one of Nier is kind of about. That's like what yeah. you're doing, right? So you get the hint, or, or I guess, uh, what do you call it? Uh, what's the other word for it? Uh, Clue? When someone gives you a lead. Lead! There you you get your first lead as to where Sealed Verse is, and uh, Popola says to go to the Airy, which is like another village or town or something. Um, but they're a very distrusting kind of yeah. people, right? I, I, you don't know what they look like. You don't know who they are. They all stay in their little capsule. They have like a little circular like capsule-shaped house. That they live in. And it's like t nailed to the side of a cliff. Like yeah. it's not a safe no. place. But they have this scaffolding everywhere. That, and, and it's hard to get to, and yeah. they, I think they do this on purpose. They don't want people in their village. Oh, yeah. And, and yeah. That's, that was, and this kind of like where I started to see my own, I, I thought Tara was successful yeah. in what he's doing thematically here because without realizing what I was you doing, were like, Who are I these started weirdos? to hate these people. Yes, exactly. Yep. <laughs> I started to really yeah. not like and to distrust and to to have negative feelings toward yeah. the people of the area. Because you're going through that area and you can listen to them inside their houses. They won't come out. Yeah. And they just sit there and talk bad about you. Yeah. They really talk so badly about like a character you. called Kaine, yeah, who, who we haven't talk met about quite so. yet. Yeah. But they're like, oh, we need to kill Kaine. And yeah. they're like, oh, stay away. You're a servant of the, the shades. And they're very <clears throat> distrustful, yeah. very... Um, unwilling to engage or help. They, mm. they want to stick to themselves. They don't want any influence from the yeah. outside. They don't want to interact with anybody. They're very, yeah. what would you call it? I guess you'd call that xenophobic or yeah, racist or whatever you want to call sure, it. Yeah. Um, Even the chief of the village, there's like a, a side quest where you're delivering a parcel to the chief and he's like, leave it on the door. Now get out of here. Get, leave it on the doorstep and I'll go away. Yep. And it's like, all right, all right. Yeah, but I, I started <laughs> having those feelings. Like as I was going through the area, I was like, I freaking hate these people. And then I realized he just did it to me. Taro yeah, just did. did it to me. He, he made, made me you, hate these people because you know, I don't. You know nothing about them. I know nothing about their culture. But you really don't like I them. I don't know why they feel this way. I don't right. know what events led up to the creation mm. of the area or why the people feel as paranoid as they do. I know nothing about them, yeah. and I started hating them because of how they were treating Nier, right? And that's understandable, right? Because it's like mm -hmm. they're also doing the same thing, so it's kind of a retaliator retaliatory response. Yeah. But this is kind of feeding into what Nier is about. It's about a difference of perspective. Yeah. If I had grown up in the airy, I wouldn't see the situation the same way yeah. as having grown up in uh, Nier's village or something like that, right? So the circumstances, the perspective changes how you view the situation. And so I have no context as to the perspective of the people of the area, yeah. and I was already hating yeah. these people. <laughs> Just dishing on them. Right? Yeah. So it was it, like right away ways, I could see that manifesting. I was like, oh man, I think good this, work. Game's, this game's gonna work good work. You'll really yeah. well, I think, <laughs> <laughs> for its central purpose. I kind of see them similar um, to in Final Fantasy VIII with the um, the Fisherman's Horizon. Yeah, I see them similar because they don't like you, and I think once or twice, if it's not this time, it's the next time, which is still within this episode. Um, they say, "Hey, you you brought the shades here. Mm -hmm. If you leave, they will leave too. Yeah, like go away. Yeah. We don't want you here. You're bringing trouble to us." And all the while, you're thinking, "What? I'm helping you. I'm killing all the shades for you," but. You know, well, well, we'll get to the the kind of final boss that shows up later on, but yeah. it is um, quite destructive sometimes. The things that we can bring yeah. to another village, to another thinking village. that we're helping them, right? And and maybe we're not really yeah. helping them very much. Very good point. So, so yeah, you leave. They don't help us much. They don't help. <laughs> we at basically all. just leave. It's like, hey, well, I guess we're not going to get this sealed verse. <laughs> yeah. Now you're leaving, and as you're leaving, you come across Kaine, who is kind of like our third major character that we're being introduced yeah. to here. Well, Yona, I guess, would be the, 
Anyways, the third major playable part of yes. the party character. Yeah. Not quite yet, but will be soon. Very soon. <clears throat> You fight a battle against her because she doesn't trust you. You're kind of there in her little hut thing. Yeah, and I don't know exactly why she doesn't trust you, but it's probably similar to the theme of the game where she just doesn't really trust people. Well, she has some kind of tie to this airy village place. Yeah. Like, they know her. They hate her. They don't they like her. her. <laughs> yeah. So, clearly, she's going to have some animosity towards other people. And we'll yeah. learn a lot more about this later. Yeah. But I want to set it up a little bit. Okay, cool. Because... She's, and, and, and Nier comments on this when he first sees her, like, wow, that's quite an outfit. Quite the outfit you got on there. <laughs> She's basically wearing yeah. lingerie, right? And normally, I would hate this. Uh, I would you see know, it as... I didn't mind it as much as I thought I, I would, would see it as pure fan service. Pure fan service. Which, I'm going to say right now, at least half is probably is. That is what it is. Well, when I saw but, her in the intro... Um, trailer that yeah. they played at the beginning of the game, I was thinking 100% full fan service, right? Yes. But, and that's part of his judgmental theme that he's kind of playing with yes. here. Um, when you meet her later on, it wasn't as weird as I thought it would be. Yeah. And and her character is, is just not what I thought it was going to be. It's, and we will learn yeah. a lot later that there are very character-driven reasons yeah. for her to emphasize her femininity. Yes. Um, I won't say more about it than that for now. Fair enough, fair enough. But I really like what they do with her. She's a yeah. fantastic character. I really liked her too. Really. Because of her, I will not be seen playing this game around <laughs> anyone I'm related your to, wife my wife, or my kids. Or <laughs> no, I will never touch this game around anyone that I like. Because they'll am close make a judgment. with like that. That's, family -wise. That's why it's so hard for me to watch anime or because there's a lot of this type of fan service yeah, that's in it. Yeah. And it's like, okay, I know that this is just kind of what they do. I'll try to look past it. But then it's like, if anyone walked in, <laughs> if you're with just, just the conversation to explain the cultural want... differences and everything. Yeah. But in this game, it's not just that it's that though. I mean, I, I think in part, fan service is a part of the reason for the design. It, clearly, because any game marketed towards teenagers that has a character yeah. that looks like that is obviously... But There's what, a different but purpose. But what they for it. then turn the character into yeah. is such a swap or a table she flip not, on the on the concept um, of fan service. Yeah, oh, that totally. That it's really <laughs> totally. quite, in my opinion, profound. I thought I it was, think so. it's really good. And her character, as much as visually, like when I mentioned in the trailer versus game versus when you meet her in the actual game. In the trailer, it's like um, you know the the idea of. You know, this might be someone you would want to sleep in, so sleep with somebody you would yeah. be attracted to. But when you meet her in the actual game, it's just the off. context is everything's not, yeah. off, and you're not really so much attracted to her as much as you are just like curious about her and the who she is and why she is. The this character way. design looks like it's going to be a sexualized character. It looks like that. In context, it is not. It is not at all. Yeah. In fact, like near is not. Yeah gazing at her with the male eye. No, other than the first time he sees her, which is like, whoa, quite the outfit. He doesn't even really bring it up again. Yeah. And as far as we can tell, he's not like pushing things in that direction at all. Yeah. Like Grimoire Vice will still reference her every now and then. He'll be like, <laughs> like, hey, why don't you get a new pair of lingerie or something yeah. like that? Or or um, he, he calls her a hussy a yeah. lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's just the translation. I actually didn't pay attention to what the Japanese would, would have been. For that word. Um, but... Yeah, it's it, Grimoire Vice continues to kind of talk down Mock to her, her because yeah. of that, but Nier does not. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. So anyways, we get the introduction. Oh, one more thing. This is kind of a dev history thing too. Uh, when that concept design was mm -hmm. first shown to Yoko Taro, of, he, the, of, Kaine? of, of Kaine, he mm -hmm. was really shocked by it. Like, yeah. But then sort of warmed up to the idea as the character was developed, right? Good. But I'm even he, he at first was like... Yeah. You know, I don't know about this. Like, I'm not sure that, <laughs> right? But like, <laughs> yeah. I just love, and this is just, again, kind of a setup, just to let mm -hmm. the viewers know, if you haven't played the game before, there's really strong narrative reasons for this, for this design. Yeah. Which is not yeah. common for fan service -y yes. female designs in Japanese games like this. They yeah. are meant to just be kind of ogled or whatever. Yes. If the, we're the talking like gaze. Cindy from Final Fantasy 15 or... Oh, Cindy, oh my it's, gosh. It's yeah, like, you know, clearly this is just meant for yeah. you to just like, oh, that's a hot character and, you know, whatever. Yeah. Do your little like waifu thing, <laughs> whatever otakus do these days. But <laughs> Kaine is not that. 
Mm. And she's not that in a way that I found to be really, really cool. So just want to put did, that out there. You're not referencing otakus as other outgroup outcasts, you're are right, you? You're right. <laughs> you're right. I apologize. You know what's the funny thing about Nier is that it's so it's so clearly anime derived or what would you it's so like anime anime clearly influenced it like crazy yeah. more so than like most of the games that we play mm-hmm. or most RPGs even um, this game is so so like in line with what you see in anime a lot of uh, you know lately um, that it's clearly just a huge influence on this whole game yeah for sure so um, you go back uh, back to the village again. You get a, you get a sealed verse by beating. The, oh, sorry. You fight a boss. You fight Kaine first. Mm. That's a boss fight. Then another huge. While shade you're fighting comes Kaine, in. yes. Yeah, this ugly, 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 freaking disgusting thing shows up with these like, like pus sacks and like yeah. oh, just so gross. Like it kind of reminds me a little bit of um, Demise from Skyward Sword. Yeah. But way grosser, like way it more. It reminds me of a there's ugh. a there's a particular boss in Dark Souls. I can't remember the name of it. It's a it's a dragon, but it's like really long and it, it, it like folds itself backwards in half and it's got like teeth on the inside. Oh my god. And gosh. it like <laughs> slams on it. That's so oh my god. And so it's that's it's, it terrible. reminds me a little bit of that design too, but yeah. but yeah, really cool looking boss. You know, I've seen something um, like this though on um, the Japanese. Oh, this was after it though. This I wonder if they took design notes from this. Um, the 2015, I think, um, Godzilla remake uh, from from Japan, not the not the, um, not the American, American one. Godzilla. Yeah. Um, but the uh, Japanese Japan one. Godzilla. It has it shows Godzilla like kind of growing up, like from mm. a weird. Not really a tadpole, but like a little baby Godzilla thing into this thing, and its its middle phase is like this, where oh, really? it just it's it's grotesque. really <laughs> grotesque. It is really bad. It's hard for me to look at things like that. I, I had a hard time with this boss. So you kill it, <laughs> and uh, it seems to be really important to Kaine that she. He kind of just walks away though. Yeah. You you basically you maim him, but he he gets away. He gets away. And Kaine yeah. is, has some kind of like personal vendetta against this yeah, particular Yeah, she's shade. like, I'm hunting the shade, you stay away. Yeah, like, yeah. you stop, this is mine. Uh-huh. But you save her, so she lets you go. And you get a sealed verse from fighting that boss. So you go back to the village again. And um, so I started doing some side quests at this part. And this is where I found Devola inside of the tavern. And she mentions that the sun never sets in this world. And I was like, wait a minute, oh. what? And if you think about it, there's no day I and night I, cycle in this game. I read, just skipped over that. That's crazy. There is no day or night cycle in this game. I didn't think of that. And the, the sun doesn't set. It's always bright outside all the time. What what physics-based so reason? So this is something that we I... We might have to talk about this, this later. This is something <laughs> that I need to send out to the comment section because well, I couldn't find the answer. It could be that it's explained answer. in an... Oh, okay. Well, if you I, couldn't the, find it, then. I, I, there is a book, like a companion book, a, a near companion book, where something like this... Kind of like an Ultimania for Final yeah. Fantasy. I have not been able to get a copy to of this. To get your hands on it's, it. It's in Japanese only. It's been uh, translated, but I haven't been able to like review that yet. Okay. So there might That's be something in there that explains it. But Because that means, uh, what do you call it? That would be like title lock? Um, yes, it's they, title lock. Yeah. The that, world is title lock. And this is true in only Automata a thousand as well. years? Usually it would take a lot longer. Yeah, it's true in Automata as well. Really? Wow. So in the near timeline, the future... The, the Earth Somehow is tidal locked. Earth becomes tidal locked yes. to the sun. So, and what's Whoa. crazy about this is that that's why that's there's crazy. no day or night cycle, right? In the yeah. stand. But um, the only answer I could find was just somebody in a game facts or something like that forum uh-huh. who said that the, the world had been hit by a meteor or something um. in between 2049 and this period. I don't know if that's true though, because it's just some dude. Well, how who else said. would that happen? That wouldn't happen any other way. Now, there's know. probably a gameplay reason they didn't want to make a day night cycle. Yes. But that's, that's the I real think reason. That's, that's, that's the real <laughs> but reason. We're, we're but skipping they... that real reason right now to try to, you know, <laughs> in game, why is that the case? Right. Yeah. So, anyways, if anybody has more Tidal information. Tidal lock wreaks havoc on the environment, by the way. Yes. <laughs> it would destroy the entire planet. Exactly. So, if anybody else has a reference, you know where I can go look up an answer to this. Yeah. I would love to read that because <clears throat> it just in the small amount of time that I had in preparing for this, I prepared a whole bunch of stuff, but I wasn't able to get to that thing. Okay, well, hey, we've got <clears throat> so we got time. We got uh, hit me episodes. up with a link to that book, the translation of it. If you know where that's at, I would love to read it. 
But the world is tile locked. It, it, the sun does not set in this world, it's freaking crazy. But they do have a weathery system yeah. in Nier. Yeah. And this is kind of the last thing I really want to touch on before moving into just finishing the summary of what we played. There is a sunny state, like a, like a sun clear day yeah. state. There's an overcast state. Yes, where more shades show where up. Where more right, shades yeah. show up, and then there's a sunset stage. But the sun doesn't actually set. So it's like, like it's in Alaska, like, where the sun yes, gets close and then comes back. Which would think back. maybe this is like a pole we're near or something, right? Uh, was what I was initially oh, thinking. Oh, interesting. But huh. like, the environment has changed so much that even at the poles, it's warm enough to be habitable or something. Hmm. I don't, again, I don't know. Or I don't know if the answer is that the meteor hit the planet and stopped it from rotating. I don't know what the answer interesting, is. Interesting. It obviously rotates in some way because the sun does go kind of down but back up and then... Okay. So it's like, I don't know. It's a, okay. Huh. But the shades, I don't know if you noticed this, shades will show up in the field when it's overcast. Yeah. But when it's sunny, they, they stick, stick near the to the cliffs. shadows near the cliffs. And, they, yeah. and they'll like venture to I come out and fight you, that. but then they'll like, run back. Very There's quickly. kind of like a mist or a steam that's coming off yes, of them. Yes, I did notice that. And they're like, oh, I can't stand the sun. And they'll run back into the shadows again. Mm -hmm. And then the, one of them will try to get brave and like come out and like, ah, and like run back <laughs> to, the, to the shade again. So that's kind of cool. It's like, depending on if it's overcast or if it's sunny, uh, the shades will either appear out in the open and fight you, or they don't. And this is a setup or a mystery to look forward to for later in the game. The first time you come across shades in the game is when you're out hunting for mutton to yes. kill a bunch of sheep and you collect them. And you're very surprised to see them there. You're like, what You the run heck? back, you're like, what are these shades doing here? Yeah. And it's like, oh, the way that Nier has exposited about shades and the threat mm -hmm. that they have would make almost anyone just go, crap, we're in danger, run, kill them. Yes, clearly, yeah. If you don't do that and you just walk up and stand next to these shades, they don't attack you at all. Really? You I can just know walk that. up there and just stand there and they will do nothing. They will not try to attack you. They are I not hostile in any way. Did not know that. They don't do anything. They just stand there minding their own business wow. and they will not attack you. And so he just well, that's interesting. slaughters <laughs> these freaking shades. Yeah. Again, we're talking about the theme of this game being a difference of perspective. This is gonna come with the shades. This is gonna become a big thing in the second playthrough. Yeah. Where it unlocks this language that the shades speak. They, they make, like we said, For kind of a B weird ending. vocalization. They do. It's like a... Then it, you, did you ever play uh, Wind Waker? I know yeah. you, that's the dumbest question I've ever asked you in my entire life. <laughs> The the little the little imps that mm -hmm. have the little pitchforks yep. that go din it din it din it din it din it something kind of like that. It sounds like that, mm -hmm. yeah. But and they if, are actually saying words. They are, and you know what's funny too. Once you get Grimoire Vice, you start to collect words. In yes. fact, there's something very interesting that he says as right after you get him, because mm -hmm. you're you're asking him, you're like, are you absorbing the blood of the shades I'm killing? Yes. And Grimoire Vice is like. Of course I am. Like, what's the big deal? <laughs> but his response is this quote that I, it's, it's, it's creepy, it's weird, but he says, uh, blood is sound, sounds are words, and words are power. Yeah. Like, blood is sound, first of all, that's, a, that's an interesting leap, but if you're a book, I guess, you know, you gotta make that jump somehow. But he's absorbing the blood, and as he absorbs the blood of the shades, every now and then you'll get, uh, they call it just a verse. Not mm -hmm. an unsealed, not one of the just big a verses. Word, yeah. Just a, a word, yeah, just a little sound, like puh, or da, or e. And those you can kind of, those infuse you kind of use in the pause menu to into make your magic. weapons. Yeah, or to infuse them. And yeah. then your weapons become stronger. Yeah, and it's like plus four attack, or mm -hmm. you, they, they get better the more words you collect. But you are collecting the sound that they make when, when you're absorbing their blood, is 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 something that is being used by the book to uh, become more powerful. So. Yep. So words again, language. Yeah. I'm telling you, it's th literally there's power. something to yeah. language in this game. Yes. I, very I, much so. I have not reached a conclusion yeah. about exactly what it is, mm -hmm. but again, my hypothesis is about creating this otherness or strangeness yeah. to culture. Yeah. And language is one of the big ways to do that. And yeah. uh, even if you understand the words, if you don't understand the culture necessarily, you might misinterpret the words or the intent. Yes. and therefore mistrust or exactly. find them too different from yourself. There's something to it. Yeah. I don't know exactly what it is, but there's something to it. <laughs> well, we'll unravel the puzzle. So anyways, you go, go back, and this is where you can kind of make a choice. 
when you leave the Airy, he, he Nier asks, should I go see Popola now or should I go see Yona? And depending on who you choose first, you'll go to one or the other location to do in the next mission. So you either go talk to Popola first and go to the junk heap, or you talk to Yona first and you go to the seafront. So I chose Popola on this playthrough and I went to the junk heap first. I don't know real, what real you did, quick, but I went to the seaside first. The but seafront first. Did we did we go back to the area? I, I can't remember if that was in this this Not current yet. playthrough. You go back to the area again after the junk heap and the okay, seafront. Okay. Then so we'll, you, we we'll will return that. there and we'll talk yeah. talk, talk about them in the next episode. Okay, cool. So I went to the junk heap first. You go there and um, there's like a there's like two brothers. Yeah. Who and their their mother is missing for like a week. She's been gone for a week. Well, this is the crazy thing though, because we got to explain what the junk heap is. Yeah, it's like a mine. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's an old like factory mine kind of thing. It's an operation. It's a whole operation, right? Mm. And so there's a bunch of technology that's in it, right? So it's um, it's it's well, I think one of the people in town described it as like um, technology that we no longer know how to use, yeah. like machines that we no longer yeah. know how to use, but they'll harvest parts for it. They'll take steel, they'll take bolts and things, and they'll take things from this broken down mine or factory or whatever it was, yeah. and they will use it to like make weapons and to mm -hmm. strengthen weapons and things. Um, and that's e essentially, and there are train tracks leading up to it, so it was like something was being shipped out of it at some point. So like maybe if it was a coal plant, it doesn't quite look like one. Um, but something like that. Um, and he mentions as they're going to it, he says, yeah, Popola said that long time ago, the humans that lived before us used to ship, or they used to drive metal crates along the rails, like over and to and from, just kind of primitively trying to describe what it is. Grimoire Vice says um, something along the lines of, no, no, um, oh yeah, humans sure were really innovative back then. Mm. And then um, Nier says, yeah, but well, then why did they no, all die? Why are they all dead? Why are they all dead? Couldn't have been that. And Grimoire really, Vice yeah. is like, well, good point, good yeah. point. That's fascinating stuff. But that's this place we're going to, and yeah. it's an old factory of some sort, and uh, they mine parts from it, but it's dangerous to go too far into right. it. Right. Because there's... The machines the are... The machines are kind of animate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, you go in there, you collect some parts and bring it out to the boys. They help strengthen your weapon. That was kind of the whole point of going there. Like, oh, you know, this guy can help you to like strengthen your weapons. But then he's like, oh, our mom's gone and she's been gone for seven days. And the, and the little boy, the younger brother, is really like distraught about it. So Nier volunteers to go in and look. Yeah. And the older brother seems to he's know. He's like, don't go. Don't worry about it. But like for the younger brother's sake and because he doesn't want to, the older brother doesn't even want to explain why. Yeah. He's like, okay, fine. Use the elevator shaft. Yeah. Because clearly he wants to know whether his mother is still alive yeah. or whatever, but he kind of knows what's going on. He does. In fact, well, there's kind of two ways of looking at this, but we'll, we'll get to it once we, you know, find, yeah. find her. <laughs> so, Spoiler alert, we find her. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You fight your way down there. And again... Very um, cool. This is where they introduce the bullet hell, like top down. Yeah. You know, things are shooting at you from all angles and you got to block or This is back. a huge part of really near cool. uh, Automata's gameplay. Yes, is, Automata is a, as well. The bullet hell sort yeah. of uh, aspect to it. Um, so similar look to like the balls that are yeah, at you just these things. big red energy balls, like globs of <laughs> like who knows what <laughs> <laughs> being shot at you. But yeah, yeah um, really I, cool. I like this level, of the dungeon itself, and I like the boss too. Um, again, I think the bosses, at least so far, mm. are where the gameplay shines the most. Yeah, I think because so. they're all designed so. in ways where they're, they, they feel different. You're not fighting them in the same way as the last boss you fought. It's not like every fight boils down to the same tactics. When you're fighting Shades, that's true. Yes. When you're fighting the robots through the, the, the mine, yeah. that's true. But against the bosses themselves, they, they are yeah. designed in ways where there's clearly like a lot of thought put into it yeah. that make them interesting and different. And, and the yeah, you memorize the patterns. And also, there's like the, um, the what would you call it? Whenever you're about to deliver something along the lines of a finishing blow. Yeah. There's like a little icon that appears. Oh, like and a you, timer. You get, yeah, and as long as you can, you know, Destroy deal the proper time. damage in that time, then he does this uh, uh, this powerful, you know, yeah. finishing thing. The book can all of a sudden use like both hands to grab things and like throw it. Yeah. Yeah. Do crazy stuff, like a huge punch. Um, 
Yeah. So it's really cool how that all works. Yeah, and you know, there are a lot of people, who, like I said, who are very critical of Nier's gameplay. And I get it, I mean, yeah. I do, but I think the boss fights alone are yeah. reason to play it. And again, we'll see how they yeah. change or mend the gameplay in the remaster. I know, to make that, it I'm better. Yeah, I'd be interested in that. So, sure. uh, we'll, again, we'll comment on that next time after I've actually had a chance to pick it up and play that version. But um, you get through there and you find out that the mother was, it looks like, running away with a lover and abandoning yeah. her kids. So this is why I say, so there are two dead people. Yes. There's the woman is dead and she's dressed interestingly. <laughs> and um, we pick up kind of some perfume from her yeah. purse or something, but she's dead. And there's a, a man that's dead next to her. And um, from that, we can imagine that these two were together. My initial thought was, oh, he kidnapped her and brought her down here. But turns out it was more um, they were mutually going away. And so this is where I think it may not have been so clear to the brother um, that his mother left mm. or that she died. Right. And he didn't want to know. Yeah. And either way, she's not coming back, right? Yeah. And so um, that's more or less why. So I don't know exactly what he knew, but his response. He, he knew that she ran away. He knew she wasn't going to come back. he didn't know whether or not she was dead or not. Exactly, yeah. And so you have to bring that bad news back. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of a, a, a he, sad he little is very, side story. Very sad to hear, yeah. Yeah. But he becomes kind of your blacksmith of sorts to yeah. strengthen your weapons, yeah. level your weapons <clears throat> up throughout the game. You bring yeah, him you the just right, get the parts. The parts. Yeah. You bring him to him, he'll strengthen your different weapons. Him, yeah. Like level them up. Yeah, that's pretty cool. But, you know, kind of an interesting little side story. You go back to town again, and this time, uh, Yona then, is... Whoa, hold on, hold on. <laughs> that kid... <laughs> so the little kid, He's I feel bad because his mom just died. But he does that weird, yeah, like, that, that one animation. motion. He does what? one animation anytime he talks. It's like, me. What is he doing? Yeah. He is so funny in his voice. Anyways, he just like just exudes like annoying little brother. He's but very. But that maybe makes you feel all the more bad for him when yeah. when things happen. Because he does. He does forced to be. He doesn't look like he's. Three or four. He looks like more like he's maybe ten. Ten, yeah. But, but he's, he's acting acts like he's three or four. Really little, yeah. <laughs> and that animation, I just can't believe. The animation it is, the is really thing. strange. But at the same time, he's saying, "I'm hungry. We haven't eaten for two days." Yeah, he's like, like constantly ah, I don't want to be too hard on him, but that was yeah. that was interesting. So you go back to town, and Yona is in a lot of pain. The the black scrawl is really wreaking havoc on her body. It's yeah. advancing quickly. And this is kind of a nice thing about Vice, actually. Anytime that Vice sees the suffering of Yona, he kind of softens up a bit. Yeah. He's like, you know, if there was anything I could do, like, I would do it for yeah. you in a minute. But th these are the times when he's not being condescending hey, and, yeah. like, uh, riding a high horse or, uh -huh. or uh, pretentious. And, but he's actually heartfelt about that. He sees yeah. that suffering of Yona. So it's kind of a nice Yeah. It, little... it, it also establishes something along the lines of... Uh, not artificial intelligence, but like artificial, like sentience, you know, yeah, like, sentience. like he, he is a book, but he has a soul. grown or developed something that you yeah. would say resembles like a soul. Like he, he is, he is as alive as anything else. Mm -hmm. um, that's, uh, that's interesting to know. So you go to Popola to say, what, you know, what can I do about this? Her pain is really bad. And she says, there's a fish you can catch in seafront, which is like a, a port village yeah. by the by where all the rich people live yeah and uh, there's a fish you can catch there that uh, you can make uh, some kind of medicinal stew or something yeah. that you can give to her to ease the pain so honestly it's probably yeah. a poisonous fish that the poison <laughs> doesn't affect humans as much and so it just has a numbing effect sure <laughs> yeah. so you go there um you fight some shades to help a guy along the way you go to the seafront and this is this is where it really hit home to me uh, mm. this cultural difference of perspective theme. Yeah. Because when I was in Seafront, I felt so comfortable. Yeah, you And I like, liked it. These are my people. And I liked the people. <laughs> yeah. And even the, the lady, the, the lighthouse lady the who's grandma, real, yeah, the old you know, woman. curmudgeon -y and yes. old and annoying. She's pretty funny. I though. still felt endeared to everything yeah. about this village except sure. for the fishing minigame, which is terrible. Um, but <laughs> yeah, it's, they don't explain well <laughs> no, it's so initially, bad. but you're supposed to point the stick in the opposite direction from, anyways, yeah, from where it's pointing It's from. a bad mini game, and it took me a really long time to figure out how to catch fish correctly. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, that's not really the point. The point is that I felt really at home in this little seaport, seafront village, but I hated the airy. 
No, and yeah. that, that's when I kind yeah. of realized, oh, this is his this is his point. This is what Yoko Taro is like doing on purpose. This is what he's doing. He's trying to but tell me something. But you look at the seafront, the sky's blue. It's it's the buildings are white. Mm. The the ground was well, like just dirt, but it's like the reddish dirt that we're familiar with from Arizona yep. and Utah. Yep. Like it's just the it just looks Right, it just looks like a, a, a normal place. Feels like home. But the area, it's always overcast, it's always gray and gloomy and dark, and it's its just, for it's many very other reasons, feel it feels it. quite different. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you go there and you struggle with a fishing game, <laughs> and so you look up somebody online who tells you how it actually works, <laughs> instead of the t terrible tutorial they gave you. You catch the right. fish to, to help Yona, then you do you, you, a side quest there for the old lady, you go to like the the mail room and grab. Yeah, a letter you've got to deliver her, her a letter, which is like from her husband who's trapped somewhere else and is healing, so he can return home. Yeah, but he's about to come home. And you and the mail, the mailman gives you a letter to take back to Popola. Yes. And if you read that letter, yeah, which I did, it says that they're not getting any responses from the area anymore. Shades yeah, are shades overrunning it, and it would over. be it would be a really massive shame if they were to lose two outposts. They've yes. lost the area now. Please be careful and take whatever precautions are necessary yeah. to protect your village because we don't want to lose contact with the outside world. Right. Seaside seems to be the least bothered by shades of all of these places. Yeah. It seems to be the one where they deal with shades the least. Yeah. So yeah. you then take that letter back to Popola and that is where I left off. I stopped playing. Yeah. So that is the end of our summary for today. Well, I'm trying to think um, if there's anything else, but um, yeah, we've basically, we've hit that point. So uh, there is a point where they give you the option. You could do the seaside first before doing the, um, sorry, the junkyard, mm. the tra junk heap, I think mm. they call it. Junk, um, junk heap, yeah. they, they do that several times throughout the game. You'll get a choice. Like, what do we do now? Go talk to Yona or go see Popola or go to this yeah. place first or go do something else. Right. And Basically, I was I thought I thought it was weird they have you decide that early on. It's like, well, I'll just go. I, I know what to do. I'll just go there. But depending on what you pick, um, d is is what determines the dialogue that Grimoire tells you as you're going back and forth. And it um, nothing will happen with Yona until you do the other thing first, basically. Right. So you they, they kind of make you they they force you to pick. It, it is it's a little strange of a mechanic, I think. Uh, but you know, for what they're doing, I think they had reason for it, so it's fine. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so some people may have played these these in different order, a different order of events than we did. Sure. Uh, but that's it, that we have but it. That more or less wraps up what we covered this week. So, yeah. reminder, we are going to be playing all the way to the first time you see credits. So the ending, the A ending, basically, yes. is what we're gonna play up to for next episode, which will come yeah. out um, in May. Uh, unless we hit our Patreon goal sometime between hey, then and it turns to a weekly show, and then we're gonna have to really like figure another out push. how hey. we're gonna restructure that. But <laughs> if you uh, want to help it return to a weekly show, hit us up on Patreon or subscribe. Star both links are in the description. Yeah, and work. just as a last thing to say, um, I freaking love this game, dude. It's really um, good. <laughs> I really, really it's like really it. It's really good. Like, uh, I, I, I don't know, like. The, Man, pe the things that people criticize about it are the things that I guess are probably not as, things I don't value as much. Not as important as to you, yeah, yeah. Like, I would say so too. I yeah. can deal with some janky gameplay, personally, <laughs> yeah. if, especially in an RPG. Because we play older games all the time. I mean, gameplay yeah. being a little awkward isn't such if, a big If deal. I can go back and, and replay some of like the, the, the really old games I played mm -hmm. as a kid. <laughs> the N64. Figure the, out how, how the yeah. controls, you know. Like, uh, this is not that bad. And I spend no. a lot of my time playing older games anyways. Yeah, yeah. But for RPGs in particular, I mean, if we're talking about a platformer, like, you have to have solid controls to uh -huh. enjoy it. Well, which but, is what I love for this. The, the controls are a little weird. If they had you do the platforming elements within 3D, like yeah. Mario Odyssey or Mario, well, uh, Mario 64 for that matter, um, it would it would have been a lot more frustrating. But any time that you have to do some heavy platforming, the camera goes to the side and you're Makes just 2D easier. gameplay. Mm -hmm. And that's way, platforms were designed for 2D, not 3D <laughs> gameplay. And I wish more games would take note from this because that is the way to do it. Yeah, so yeah. anyways, I can deal with some janky gameplay in, an in a story-driven RPG 
if the story itself is really yeah. is really compelling, if it's really driving me forward. Yeah, and if the themes are you know yeah. like compelling and and the characters are heartfelt, you know, yeah. I, I get that from this. And game. like uh, all of that side of it to me is really well done. The dialogue is succinct and it's well it's written. It's really. And what did you think about the voice acting? The voice acting is great. It's quite good. It's really good. Now I'm Japanese, but still, it it is really really well done. Very I mean, well. In done. comparison to other Square Enix properties, where they tend to struggle with that sometimes. sometimes. It depends, yeah. again, it depends on who's producing it. There's different people involved. So like Final yeah. Fantasy XII has phenomenal voice acting. Oh, very good. Yeah. And Final Fantasy XIII's voice acting while having fine talent really bothers me. Yeah. So it's a voice direction thing. Yeah, so I think it's more direction. The voice yeah. directing here is good. The talent is good. good. Yeah. The, the written dialogue is good. So it all just like comes together very cohesively. Yep. The story is fascinating. It's really unique. You haven't oh, really yeah. seen anything like it before. Yeah. Um, and the, the hook for the prologue was so strong that like the mysteries that they set up were so like mm -hmm. interesting and intriguing that like I just got to figure out what's I going know. on. And so like <laughs> I'm going to be willing to deal with some jank gameplay here and there. Yeah. But it's actually not as jank as I think some people make it out to be. It's just a bit repetitive. And there's some parts like riding the boars. That oh my be, like, gosh, that was okay. It's and really irritating <laughs> because you hit a wall and he just stops. He just stops. And you gotta, yeah. yeah, and like trying to like turn him is oh, like we didn't really... talk about the boar, man. So you know, there's some there's some parts to it that are like this is dated. Yeah. This could definitely be improved. Maybe it will be in the remaster, but I'm willing to deal with that when there is such a strong, compelling story being told in okay, an RPG yeah. like this. And so, yeah, near for me is a really, really, really. Great game so far. It's off to a good start. I really like it. Yeah, and I so. agree. And there was something that you had mentioned. Maybe I'll just wait till next time. Um, but yeah, I mean, I basically, I agree. The world is fascinating. It's a really good, yeah, really good game so far. No complaints. So not yet, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> that is going <laughs> to do it for for this episode. Uh, we appreciate you guys watching and for supporting the channel. And like we said, play to ending A, the first ending of the game. Uh, that's where, where we'll stop for next time. Until then, uh, have a great time with the, the remastered version of Near Replicant. Yes, we uh, will too. Now that it's out, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Peace out.